All right, good morning. Welcome to MACPA's Professional Issues Update Town Hall Spring BNI Edition. So we're what, two days into spring, and it looks like it's going to be a really nice day out here. So we're excited to have you all here. We're here in Rockville and virtually on the web. We've got over 160 members in business and industry on the webcast today. So welcome to everyone out there. A couple quick announcements. We are going to take a break in the middle and we'll talk about uh, our sponsors and some of the other things that are making this possible. But um, Twitter, how many of you all are on Twitter, by the way? Where's my people on Twitter? That's all. Wow, you guys. So Twitter is uh, hashtag PIU16. And that for the uh, audience as well, if you want to follow along on Twitter, we do have some uh, extra articles and things that will be tweeted out that will give you some more resources as we go. And uh, we're going to be doing polling. I'm going to get you guys to log on to that in a minute. And that will also work, by the way, for our virtual audience. So you guys can actually follow along with the polls and see what uh, everyone participate and see what uh, everyone else is saying. We'll also be using that for uh, Q&A today. Um, I also want to introduce a couple of members of our team that are making it possible. First of all, we got our Blue Ocean webcast team back there, Brian and Dan. So everybody say hi to those guys. And you guys can't see them because they're behind the cameras. Uh, Edith Ornstein, our, one of our chief bloggers and editors, is here. Uh, so at Edith O, if you want to follow her on Twitter. She's doing a lot. Andrew Hood over here, our uh, head of sponsor business development. And in the hall that you couldn't see that we're greeting you, uh, Rebecca Brown and Ryan Way from our um, both membership and professional development teams. So with that, I want to kind of get right into, uh, first I want to start by recognizing sponsors because putting on the town halls, this is part of our value proposition, right? You get free CPE as part of your member benefit. We started it in the recession of 2007, if many of you remember, and uh, we've continued that. So if you ever want justification to your employer for why you're paying these dues, you say, look, we're getting free education on this and um, actually free good education. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk more about that. But these are our uh, major sponsors. BB&T uh, is our bank sponsor. Kelly Benefits and Payroll. Tribridge, which is uh, benefits, healthcare, and a lot of other things. And they're here with us, by the way. There's Tyler over there. So everybody say hi to Tyler. Yeah, give him a round of applause. Show him some love. Uh, Aon, our uh, insurance carrier. If you ever have questions about professional liability, Aon's the folks to go to. Sage for your accounting, ERP solutions. Citrix ShareFile for technology, doing uh, secure document work. Walters Kluwer, CCH. Uh, formerly CCH, Zero, uh, another accounting software provider, Avalara, sales and use tax compliance systems, um, and at the, our kind of premier bronze sponsors, USB, which is credit card processing. If you ever need uh, help thinking of in installing credit card processing, USB can help you from that standpoint. And then uh, Long and Foster, actually, if any of you want to sell or buy a house, those guys decided that they wanted to reach CPAs as well. So one round of applause to recognize all of our great sponsors <laughs> who make this possible. All right, I'm going to um, do two more pieces. One is note taking. Now, many of you, how many of you guys have been here before? How many? So how many first timers do we have? Where are my first timers? No first timers. You're all oh one. All right, good. Well, welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Any of the veterans can give you some help if you need it. This is our little, uh, this is our version of an app for taking notes. Some have asked why it's not green. Why don't we put this in an electronic version? Any of you who've been here before, do you know what that answer is? Why do we not put this in an app? Bingo. Stanley, thank you. So, uh, the answer is the research that we have on learning actually says that still today uh, learning in terms of making connections in your brain is done best by actually physically taking notes. The act of handwriting or, or writing notes makes better connections in your brain. And so we decided to stay in this kind of a format for you. And in there are some good places to take notes, but more importantly, 
So every other, uh, every odd page has some things to make you think about what you're learning. And we're going to give you a little bit of time today to fill this out, or even during the break you might take a few moments. But for instance, on page five it says, which of the things I've learned today do I think have the highest likelihood of impacting my firm or organization and why? So the notion of thinking about what we're talking about. Uh, on page 11 it says, what new insights am I thinking about? What are the next things I need to learn? Uh, and then there's a bold action plan back there for five things that you're going to do with something that you learned today. So our hope is that you actually come away with this with something maybe actionable in terms of what it means to you. And to set that up, we are going to cover kind of the whole profession. We're especially focusing on business and industry, government, nonprofit, those of you who are in those sectors, because this one's kind of meant for you. And we'll also talk about some events we have for you. But here's how you have to think about this, is that when we're talking about all these big issues and trends and things that are going on, the question for you to say is, so what? Like, so what about this matters to you? So when we're talking about some of these key areas, right, you should be thinking about, okay, now I see what's going on. What's it mean, if anything? And throw away the stuff that says that, that doesn't apply to me, I don't really care about that. But that one nugget, you might go, hey, that applies to me. And you're going to want to write that down. And that's how we think about this idea of learning. Because we believe in this period of rapid change and increasing complexity, the winners are going to be those who can keep their rate of learning greater than the rate of change. And we would actually add another one, greater than the rate of your competition. And that competition could be in your same department, or it could be in another company or another organization. So we call it L greater than C squared. And so that's our effort to do that. Some of you who are here just to get your CPE and check the box, you can do that too. But uh, we're hoping to actually give you some value for your investment of time today. So with that, I'm Tom Hood. I'm the CEO of the Maryland Association of CPAs. I am a CPA. And uh, I am also a, uh, came out of a career as a CFO. I never did any public accounting in my career. Uh, I was always the victim of public accounting. I had to, I had to do audit, you know, comply with the auditors and taxes. <laughs> Is that you? How many of you are like that? How many of you guys know? Oh, okay, so no public accounting. Just, you just have to. So um, anyhow, and then obviously I'm now a CPA in business and industry in the nonprofit sector as a CEO. So uh, that's kind of another way of, of, uh, of thinking about that. All right. With that, let's kind of look at what you guys are thinking. So we got some polls set up. So we're going to uh, ask you guys to log on. So again, JHU guest, if you want to get on the network, put your email in when that web browser comes up, and then hit enter. And then it'll say done and ready, and you should light up your little Wi-Fi. Then you're going to go to macpapiu.cnf.io. It's a new one. So some of you who've been here before, it might try to take you to the old one. We're still using that. But we set up a separate instance of this conference polling uh, application for uh, Town Hall. So those of you on the webcast should see this as well. macpapiu.cnf.io. And we did tweet a picture of the whole audience. So some of you guys should like do some selfies so we can see who's on the webcast. And uh, hashtag PIU. There will be prizes, by the way. So if you do that, you could get some, uh, some extra love from our prize patrol. All right, is everybody ready? Everyone logging on? Anyone having problems? If you're having problems, raise your hand, and we'll send one of our team over to kind of help you log on. Everybody good? Anyone need help? You need help? Hey, could we, is Edith back there? Could you help him maybe log on, Edith? Everybody good? All right, let's see what happens. So first, an easy one. How many years have you been a CPA? Just put the number in there. Do you see it? You don't see it? I don't know how to use it. All right, you just click on Okay, so when you find that app, just click on it, and now you're in, right? Now the questions will come to you. So once you get into the, this MACPA PIU, just click on that session. It's the only session in there. Click on that, and the polls will come to you. Got it? Do you see it? Are you good? I just have an iPhone. 
You don't have an, a I smartphone? Have only food. No, there's another one over there. <laughs> I think there's two of you. <laughs> Who else has no smartphones? <laughs> so we got, we got to work on you guys. Like we're going to have to talk to you at break. <laughs> Because we would say that smartphones are probably one of the most powerful learning devices you have. I don't want to spew it too much. I hear you. <laughs> All right, so average is 22.6. Hopefully the studio audience is pumping that in. By the way, you guys click on that event and, uh, and then put your number of years in there. Um, let me see. You need, we got to figure out how to say how to enter. Oh, there you go. No, you hit that. Just hit go. Okay, okay. So yeah, if you guys are having trouble entering that stuff, look on there and either hit go or return once you answer the question. So uh, it just went up a tenth of a point, didn't it? That means we have some older people. It is interesting how it seems like the younger ages go in there a lot faster, don't they? Yep, they just yep, saying. They do. Just saying. So 22.5, the average is coming down. Now it's going back up. It's like a horse race. So is everybody voting. I know I'm just getting your fingers warmed up, right? We now, it takes a little time on the first one. We're going to move a little faster once we get you used to voting. And by the way, we will uh, send you these. But interestingly enough, last year when we did this in the spring, we sent the results to Accounting Today, and they published the results, saying here's what Maryland CPAs are thinking in business and industry. And they had a whole article that they published from what you guys said. So you're influencing the national agenda as we speak. So vote. You can't vote often because we won't, it won't let you vote more than once, but you can vote early. Oh, it's going back up now. Now our baby boomers are figuring out where the enter key is. <laughs> okay, so again, hopefully studio audience, MACPA, PIU.CNF.IO is the website. Go in there, click on that uh, session, and you'll be able to see the votes and participate if you so choose. All right, 23. Is everybody voted or is anyone still trying to figure it out? We good? Okay. We're going to keep moving then. So 23 years uh, average experience of CPAs. It's a pretty seasoned bunch here, right? Okay, now what segment of our profession do you work? Theoretically, you're all business, industry, or government, <laughs> but I do know some public practitioners even sneak out during tax season, and some are consultants. So we have a special consulting one for folks like you, Kelly, that don't do tax, right? Okay, so uh, public practice, we've got two of those. B&I, 43, retired, uh, transition, so the retired members you can always see by what? Looking at their big smiles, right? They're like, I just, I'm just here kind of keeping up on stuff, but <laughs> life is good, generally. <laughs> so, uh, all right, 53 B&I, 24 not-for-profit, 13 government, public practice and tax, 6, consulting, 18, Retired five, transition two, and other. What did I miss? Oh, you know what? Educators? Is that what I'm missing? What's the other? Anyone want to disclose what other is that I didn't capture? I should put education up there, right? If there's edu any educators in the audience, by the way? So one. What else did you put as other? Anyone? What did I miss, category-wise? They don't want to be disclosed. <laughs> what is it? Oh, online? That don't know which, what they are. So you're right, you guys would have to, you could tweet it and we'd know what other is. So we have four others, uh, count still coming. So 63, B&I, not-for-profit, government. By the way, you all uh, represent about half the profession and half of our membership continually. So uh, us folks that are not in public practice represent about half of the full profession in the United States. There's about uh, half a million, uh, almost 600,000 CPAs nationally. Uh, in Maryland, it's around 10,000 and about half uh, consistently are business and industry, government, not for practice. Okay. How many are in Maryland? Stabilize. About 10,000 active licensed. There's, we're, actually, we, 
that's our kind of our membership is in that range. The full the full group licensed is about eighteen thousand, I guess. Maryland's one of the top ten states in terms of numbers of CPAs, believe it or not. So we're a small state, but pretty big in terms of how many CPAs. All right, I think it's settled down now. Hopefully you all on the audience are seeing the, the charts here. Any of you guys want to take pictures and tweet, that's always fun too. So let's move on to the next one though. Professional designations do you have? Select as many as you have. So just like to see what other initials you guys might have behind your names. So CGMA, CFE, Certified Fraud Examiner, CIA, Certified Internal Auditor, is what we mean by that, not the CIA down the street. Uh, FP&A, CGFM, which is a, a government financial manager, right? CISA, uh, Internal Systems Auditors, and, well, others. So we're missing a lot of designations. What are we missing in the business and industry. I know we're missing a lot of practice designations. We didn't put them in on purpose. CAE, which is a, yeah, like, okay, so CAE would be a good one. I'm going to have to write these down. What else are we missing in terms of other designations? CFF, which is a what? Certified Fraud Forensic? Okay, that's a good one. What else? CF. A, which is Chartered Financial Analyst, or, okay, so, CFF, right? That was a fraud and forensic, CAE. Boy, a lot of alphabet stuff, huh? What else, any other ones that come to mind? Because there's a decent amount we miss. We like, always like to try to get those in there. I mean, there's ABV, there's PFS, there's all the ones in practice, so we'll add those in the, in the practice town halls. But uh, any other ones? To come to mind. All right, so wow, 43 of you are CGMAs. That's pretty strong uh, attendance wise. That's pretty neat. And we're going to talk about the CGMA uh, more today in terms of where that's going as a, a profession in total. Okay, next is top challenges. Pick the top five. So, what are the things that are most challenging for you. Uh, I think we got about 11 or 12 of those, so pick the top five. And hopefully those of you guys on the webcast audience are, are participating as well. It's like a horse race, isn't it? If all those votes are coming in. Okay, what are we noticing here? There's definitely a top four, isn't there, kind of going on. Doing more with less. Being reactive versus proactive, not enough time, and information overload. Now, it's funny because I threw some more in based on the last year, and I'm noticing that the same basic five are showing back up again. Although there's changing accounting and technology systems in there, 60 of you. Uh, so what are you seeing here? What's the winner? Doing more with less? is the winner, is that right? So doing, what is it? So doing more with less is number one. Number two looks to be information overload, changing standards and regs. Number three, oh no, excuse me, is that right? Yeah, number three would be not enough time tied with being reactive versus proactive. And then number four is changing accounting and technology systems. Is that right? Does that kind of feel like your world? 
for the most part, or anything there you would say, I don't buy that. I think I got to tweet this one. So comments, what do you guys think? Accurate view of the world? Yeah? Yeah, yeah doing more. So there's a couple that have come up consistently. The new one is changing accounting and technology systems. And we actually uh, are seeing that in the national survey. So the way we get some of these questions, by the way, is we look at them from what we see in terms of research around the profession, what we see going on in the CFO studies, et cetera, and then we kind of update it and get you guys to weigh in on that. And you are pretty consistent with what we're seeing in those national surveys. So it's kind of good to know we're all in the same boat, right, from that perspective. So if you were feeling like it's just you, it's not. This is what we're seeing everywhere. Okay, ready, next one. Are you future ready? This comes from the AICPA study, and I think you've got the definition in there. And future ready is are you uh, aware, kind of predictive and adaptive of emerging trends and issues, especially around technology, demographics, and some of these other ones. So how future ready are you relative to, and then we'll talk about where that national average is as well. It's select one and you select You get to select one. Yeah, you, can, you can't say I'm both. <laughs> so I'm going to let you guys keep that vote till it settles down a bit. So only 2% of you are completely not future ready. About half are kind of not really stuck in the day-to-day. 42% -day. are saying somewhat. So that's what, 92, 94. So that's about 6% that say you're actually feeling good about being future ready, right? 92, 94, so about 6%. Now that's interesting because the national average is 8%. Only 8%, I'd say, by the way from a CPA profession. That was a national study by the AICPA about a year and a couple months ago. And uh, so you guys are slightly behind that, although I would argue the somewhat is saying you're on the way there, right? You're starting to spend more time thinking about forward-looking activities and less on staying up with the day-to-day. -day. Does that make sense? So hopefully the studio audience is following with us. All right, let's see what's next. Are you in the cloud? So we're seeing some, some stats on cloud adoption. And there they go, the horse race is on. Okay, what are we showing there? I'm just tweeting. I'm not answering emails, by the way. <laughs> and I'm going to be checking to see if you guys are tweeting. Let's see. Ah, I see my man Stanley back there is doing some tweeting. And Matt just did a, a tweet out. He's a little egg. We got to hatch his egg. Uh, DVCPA, Betsy, Re so we good. We got some folks. Starting to tweet, you guys will be eligible for some prizes. All right, any surprises here? What do you think? So 25% say not going at this time. 11% uh, are planning to migrate, and about half of you are somewhat migrating there now. So you're on the transition path, and about 13% are all cloud. Is that right? Does that make sense? Any questions or comments about any of that? Surprises? You're shocked that 38 people, 26% are no. Kelly says she's shocked that 38 of you said no. 
Not going at this time, right? At this time. Yeah, Stan. Pardon? Ah, so you might, it might be the way the company systems are or something that you can't control. Certainly in the larger installs, right? Because the really large ERPs haven't moved cloud-based yet. Some of them are. Uh, certainly government and many non-for-profit systems aren't cloud-based at this stage either. So that could be the other part. You've got a decent amount of, of those folks who it's not in their control. That's a good, uh, good point. Anyone else? Any other questions, comments? So good. This is good information to have as we start to look at what's happening around our profession. We always have to have our generational question. So let's see what we know how old you are average. Let's see how the generations work. Wow, look at the Xers are, uh, well, they were just quick on the draw. But we're starting to see our millennials showing up more. This is awesome. There was a time when I had to like bring a millennial to show you what they look like. <laughs> We're, we're quickly getting past that, I'm glad. Now i got to start bringing you Gen Zs. Because if you thought millennials were tough, you ain't seen nothing yet. Gen Zs going to rock your world. All right, so we got a couple of matures, the greatest generation. Uh, about, it's still moving. Our boomers are, uh, are still keying in there. Gen Xers, about 29%, 10% millennials. Oh, our millennials are still popping in right now. So interesting uh, demographic. Now I would say if when you're thinking about generations, you guys have all seen me do this before, although I know historically that you forget everything I tell you from one town hall to the other. So I can use the same material and you wouldn't know. You'd be going, wow, <laughs> when did that happen? Uh, so if this bar was over here, greater than the green, that would actually be representative of the populations that are in the workplace right now. So millennials surpassed baby boomers uh, this past year, and they're about double, it's almost right, double Gen X. So many people have said, why are we having a talent shortage? The talent shortage is in the manager ranks, right? The manager level employee both in practice and in government, not, you know, not profit and business. And it's because of, there's a physical less Gen Xers birth wise in the United States. So it's, a, it's, what's, it's considered a hard trend, it's a fact, right? So that's why everyone's going, where are all the managers? Because there's only one of them for every two boomers. So when the boomers retire, you're looking for your succession plan the competition for Gen Xers is going to be fierce. It's already starting and it's going to get worse, right? Every year it's getting worse, probably for the next five or six years. So where's my Gen Xers, by the way? So my Gen Xers, I call this like hug your Gen Xer year. <laughs> we should be taking care of them. So reach over, like shake their hands, grab them at break, give them a little hug, because they're the linchpin generation, by the way, between baby boomers and millennials. We've talked a lot about this, and I get the pleasure of working with every part of that generational cycle, so I can tell you what they talk about, right, when you're not in the room in other generations. So, yes? It's, it's going to take about seven to ten years to work through that whole demographic. Now, the, the reality is boomers are working longer, right? So the em, you know, employment levels are staying longer because we're healthier and able to work more, or in some cases have to work more. And um, millennials, that, so the, the answer to that, though, is if you're going to wait for it to fix, you're in trouble. Instead, what you need to do is fast track millennials. Find your high potentials and begin to groom them, right? So that they can move up faster and be better, better, right? Faster and ready for management. The other one is what we call the boomerang. Take your boomers who are retiring and bring them back in a consulting capacity or some kind of part-time potentially to help supplement uh, that. And some companies are being very creative with that, right? They're bringing a boomer back in a consulting capacity, maybe part-time, and pairing them with a millennial. 
now you're going to get that knowledge transfer because that's the other part is the biggest fear, believe it or not, millennials' biggest fear is that us boomers are going to leave and not tell them what we know. Like they actually want to know what you know. You might not feel that when you're talking to them because they sometimes can convey confidence that they know a lot of things you don't, which is also true. But you have to not treat them like parents, which is what they tell us. So you pretty much like, well, when I was your age, this is what I did. They don't want to hear that, right? They want you to listen to their ideas and talk about your ideas and see if you can actually collaborate and make them a better idea from both of them. Now that Gen Xers are in the middle and they're kind of frustrated because all they hear us talk about are boomers and millennials. Is that right? <laughs> You're like the forgotten generation. And the reality is Gen X, and we've talked about this a lot, Gen X is the generation that actually started the work-life balance idea, but they didn't have the bargaining power to convince anyone that they had to listen to them. So they kind of sucked it up and went along with the boomers because they had to. And then here comes the millennials and they're like rocking everything. All of a sudden now it's like all about the millennials. Let's be, you know, let's do what they need to do. So you really need to be conscious of all your generations need to be collaborating and sharing all of their knowledge and experience. It's not unlike diversity and inclusion. It's like we're much smarter together than we are separately. Right? And the age of any one of us being the smartest guy or gal in the room is over, isn't it? In this age of, of internet and fast paced changes and all that. We actually have a saying that we've looked at with some research that says that the collaboration curve is going to replace the experience curve because of the way knowledge is expanding it so rapidly. In other words, the old days you got experience and you got more experience and then you traded on that experience, right? And you were the expert. But how can you be an expert when the bodies of knowledge are changing like that today? So you have to rely on what? Collaboration with others who might have information you don't have. That's, by the way, the power of social media. That's also the power of being together in groups like this, coming to conferences and coming to events with other people. There's all kinds of research about Deloitte around innovation that says the number one thing people have to do is get out of their company and be exposed to other people and other ideas. And so that's really where we believe an association can help you from that standpoint. But if you're stuck in your own silo listening to what you all only know, think about what could be changing around you that you have no clue what's going on. And you come to an event like this and hear something and meet someone at the break and suddenly you go, wow, that's a whole different approach to doing that that I never heard of. And wow, what could I do with that? Right? Because innovations often don't come from inside your industry. Neither do disruptions. Where do they come from? Outside. Did Uber come from inside the Taxi Cab Association? No. Did Airbnb be invented by the hotel industry? No. And what's going to be disrupting us? In the practice side, TurboTax and all those guys, they didn't come from inside the accounting profession for the most part. They come from outside, right, from a technology standpoint. So we have to be thinking about that both from a threat and an opportunity perspective, right? Disruption and innovation. So any other questions on that? The only thing I'll say about Gen Z, they're graduating right now. So when we go out and talk to, we, we just spent the last couple of weeks, we were with high school kids uh, at the National Academies of Finance, and we were with uh, Beta Alpha Psi and Taos in the big mid-Atlantic meetings, about 350 uh, young students, right, from all over the mid-Atlantic. And these young people have a completely different view of the world. They want flexibility, they want purpose-driven work. We're going to talk about those. We've been telling you that for about three or four years. What's happening now in a talent shortage is if you don't do those things, you're going to see people leaving at faster rates. And so your turnover will go up, then your retraining costs will go up, right? It's, it's a predictable problem that you can anticipate. So start thinking about what that means. And the Gen Zers, these are folks for the most part that grew up on mobile. So many of them don't really use keyboards and would prefer not to. So they're going to come to your work and start touching your screens and go like, why doesn't this work? <laughs> so have fun with that, right? That's why I said you thought millennials were tough. So anyhow, all right, let's see what else we got up here. So business outlook. You guys are the, I think, the lifeblood and pulse of our business economy. So this is meant for generic. What's just your overall outlook for your business or your companies or uh, organizations? Uh, 
So we got the optimists are winning right now. 20, 50 percent. Now it's a little bit higher. The horse race is on. Some very optimistic. Some neutral. The horse race is still going. I keep people. Votes are still coming in. Hopefully you guys in the audience are following along and watching the polls. Again, macpapiu.cnf.io. And uh, so what do we have here? 78 people. Let's see, 47. So 59%. Oh, 60%. Somewhat to very optimistic, 32% neutral, 7% somewhat pessimistic, 2% say things aren't improving and they're not. Oh, look, I got my first selfie from the audience. Yay. DEIs, I love it. So, so studio audience, keep the selfies coming. Again, we'll, we will have some uh, potential prizes for you so we can see what you guys look like. Here, I'll take a picture of these guys so you can see what these guys look like too. <laughs> We got to keep that going so we can connect the virtual to the, to the real. All right, so we got 47% um, somewhat optimistic, 12% very optimistic, 31% neutral, 7% somewhat pessimistic, and 2% uh, pessimistic, not feeling good about where we are. Does that make sense? Again, we'll be, um, I think accounting today will love to hear this. So this is kind of the pulse of Maryland, uh, CFOs, controllers, et cetera. All right, that's it. So we're going to get ready to, to uh, jump into the regular presentation now. Now, by the way, on here, I'll have this teed up. You can ask questions, like you know from uh, Conferences I.O., so it's anonymous, and you can go ahead and put whatever questions you might have as we go, and then between me and the team, or yell if I don't see it right away, we'll address them as we go. Okay, we talked about this, but slideshare.net is also a place. You got the, the deck sent to you, but if you want to look at this deck and some other ones, slideshare.net slash tHoodCPA. We pretty much post almost everything I do gets posted up there. So you can download them, you can use them. Um, Slideshare is a great place. If you're trying to do a presentation for work or for something you're doing volunteer-wise, absolute amazing source of content. You can pretty much search anything and get some very cool professional presentations, many of which will let you download them. Many will let you actually repurpose those slides with attribution, right? Remember your copyright laws and uh, give them credit. So sometimes, you know, when you're trying to get people to think about change, or you might be coming back from this and go, wow, there was some really good stuff there. I wish my boss knew that, or I wish my team back at, the, at work knew this. Well, you could take the SlideShare deck and send it around to them, right? You could schedule a little lunch and learn and maybe go over some of that stuff or some of the key points that you thought were really good. The other thing about SlideShare that they've added is you can actually clip slides and keep a little folder of key slides that you go, that's a keeper and I want to you know, email that or I want to use it in a presentation. So you can literally use the little clipper and store them online. It's owned by LinkedIn. You can also link SlideShare presentations to your LinkedIn profile. So if you want to be known for things or let people know what you're thinking about, that's a great tool to do that. Okay? All right. We like to start with the lookout posts, like what's going on around the profession. Well, there's a lot going on. Uh, actually, today, they will release my uh, state of the industry post for LinkedIn. I'm an influencer, so LinkedIn uh, asks me to write an update every year about this time on what we see going on in the industry. So we do all of our research in the winter, uh, obviously feedback from you guys over the town hall season, and then we update it. So you'll see a post on my LinkedIn profile that should be uh, published today. Edith, you could even check that to see if it went live yet. As soon as it goes live, we'll tweet it out, by the way, for those of you uh, who are out there. But if you go to LinkedIn, you can follow me. So you might, you know, you might say, I don't want to connect to that guy. <laughs> But you might want to follow, you just click follow, and then when we throw posts out there, you'll get updates of what we see going on. Obviously, our Maryland Association 
of CPAs. LinkedIn group is another place to see a lot of the stuff that's going on. Um, I repurpose things that Edith and Bill are posting about things going on in the profession. So uh, that should be happening. But I want to start with waves. So we like to talk about this idea of waves of disruption. This winter, I was at an association event. Uh, ASAE put on a, a tech conference down in DC. Uh, I got to speak at that conference. And in it, there was about 100 uh, association executives, CIO, CTO, CEOs, uh, COOs, et cetera, CFOs. And one of the questions I asked them was, how many of you in the association world are feeling disrupted? How many, what percentage do you think were feeling disruption? Anyone guess? All of them. Very close. Anyone else guess? No. It was 96%. Only 4% said not feeling any disruption. 96% were somewhat to extreme. And actually, it was mostly, I think it was something like 76% were severe to extreme disruption. Now, why is that? Where's my association folks in here? I know there's a few. Why is that? What's the disruption issue? This is because uh, people that are working uh, often think of themselves rather than what the purpose of the business is. Well, that's true. So, all right, so Rick just said, for you guys who couldn't hear it, uh, he said sometimes people are thinking about themselves rather than the purpose of an organization that they might support. So getting younger people involved in associations is a challenge. There's a generational notion about it. Yeah? Getting data, getting data on your membership. Most of our systems are horrible, and so we don't have good customer data like commercial organizations do, including us. Yeah, that's another good one. I would think predictable funding would be a good one. Predictable funding, right? With all the government, especially if you rely on grant money from a state or federal government, with all the different cuts and tax issues that have happened, that's constrained a lot of philanthropic and uh, funding type organizations. Anyone else? And in the uh, membership groups like professional associations or trade associations, it's competition from commercial people, right? So CPE has been a big challenge for us. We've seen that disruption as online free stuff emerges all the time, and uh, as well as getting members' attention. The whole point of you guys being extremely busy means it's hard to get your attention. So sometimes we can't get your attention, or we send you so much stuff, you don't know how to filter that, right, from that standpoint. So those are challenges that we're all facing. It's also showing up in business and industry, governments as well, right, as this whole kind of wave of change happens. And it hit me not too long ago. I was down at the ocean last year and at our beach retreat, which is a nice commercial for you guys, right? So right before the 4th of July, if you need sun, surf, and CPE, it doesn't get any better. Um, anyhow, the, at the ocean, right, how many of you guys have been to the beach? Almost all of you should have been to, oh, yeah, should, come on, you've had to go to the beach if you live in this area. So uh, when you go to the beach, I like to say there's two ways of going in the water. So just imagine it's like a nice hot day, right? We just came off of this like snow on Monday. We want a nice, hot, sunny day. You're at the beach. It's nice. The sand is hot. You got to like, run down there and get your blanket out. You're looking at the water. You hear the seagulls kind of chirping overhead. And, uh, and you want to go into that water. So now when you go into the water, in the mid-Atlantic at least, it's a little bit nippy, isn't it? So there's two ways of going in that water, I like to say. One is the inch by inch freeze. You like step in and let that inch of your legs start to freeze and then you try to go up to maybe your calf and try to make it all the way in, right? As you timidly go through that. Or what's the other way? The plunge, right? You just like get hot, so you're, I'm just gonna jump in. Now when you jump into that water and you're out there, and you maybe swim around a little bit, and all of a sudden you stop and like look at the shore, maybe wave to your spouse or family or some friends on the beach. And what happens often if you're not paying attention? Big wave, right, comes up behind you. I, I, was, I, I remember my wife was always like, look, you know, you're like. <laughs> so when that big wave crashes over you, you get kind of tumbled around, right, the salt, they call it the washing machine, you get in all that foam, and you, know, you come up full of sand. And, if you're not careful, what happens again? Another wave, right? Especially if you're looking towards the shore. If you're looking at the shore away from those waves, you can get clobbered. I like to think about the waves of change the same way. So what's happening right now, we're gonna show you the kind of research that we're seeing about this, is that the waves 
are getting bigger and they're getting more frequent. So I heard this saying that I love. It's my favorite one for this year. I'll have to change it up next year. Well, you guys won't remember, so I can use it again next year. <laughs> so what I like to say is you can't stop the waves, but you can learn how to surf. You can't stop the waves of change, but you can learn how to ride them. Right? That saying, by the way, comes from John Kabat-Zinn. But I think that's really apropos right now. And so I think the notion here of us as CPAs, and in all the ways we work, but especially for you in business industry, we have to change our perspective from looking at the shore, which is the equivalent of the rearview mirror, and begin to look out of the windshield, which is face the waves, so we can see what's coming, and we can anticipate and be proactive and figure out how to ride them. Does that make sense? So I think that's what we're going to try to talk about. All the research that we're seeing is showing that this is not going to slow down. It's going to speed up. It's going to accelerate. And there's some, there's some research from that. Our, our board of directors, Kelly, by the way, over here is on our board of directors. And uh, we've actually engaged a uh, national futurist, a guy named Dan Burris. We'll talk a little bit about that later on, to actually help us position our profession and you for the future from that standpoint. So we'll talk a little bit about how that works. So in what we try to track when we're looking at where the trends are, this is one that's come on our radar not too long ago. It's called the World Economic Forum. Anybody familiar with that? It's in Davos, Switzerland every year. It's like all the big business minds, uh, actually business social leaders of different uh, groups come together and kind of talk about a global uh, environment and what's happening globally. And so many of these big global companies, as well as uh, leaders of government, et cetera. And in that, this is uh, Klaus, and I forget his last name. He's the head of the World Economic Forum, but look at what he says there. He says, we stand on the brink of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we live, work, and relate to one another in its scale, scope, and complexity, the transformation will be unlike anything humankind has experienced before. So I would say that right, this is the idea that we're kind of entering what they would call the big deal phase. And we'll talk about some of the things that we're seeing from that standpoint. Which goes to what we've talked about here before, but this is the idea of VUCA. And it's interesting because this happened right after 2007. This is the um, Institute for the Future actually used this phrase for business for the first time. Prior to that, it was a regular in the military circles, right, relative to all the stuff that was going on with global terrorism and how this whole new world was evolving from a military security standpoint. Because it was coined by the uh, US Army War College up in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. So VUCA stands for, it sounds like a nice Italian word, like a little VUCA. It's, uh, <laughs> Right, like a little restaurant, a little VUCA with that pasta. Uh, VUCA stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And what happened is they actually said that during the recession, remember we were in the midst of that recession? So they call it the Great Recession now of 2007 and 8. I've coined it as the Great Recession of 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, right? Because it felt like it never ended. So in that recession, everyone was saying, we're in this recession, right? The global meltdown from the big short. Anyone see the big short movie, by the way? So that, that was what caused that thing back in that time frame. And they said, well, it's going to all get back to normal again, right? Really? Everyone kept waiting. It's going to get normal again. Yeah. Has it gotten normal? No. no. This is the new normal, is what they're saying, right? That's when they coined that phrase and applied it to business equally to what they've applied to the, to the uh, kind of security armed forces world. So what that meant was we're in this phase of constant change and fundamentals are shifting because of what primarily? What's causing those big shifts? Technology. technology. Actually, you can say it's kind of the perfect storm, right? It's technology, globalization, and demographics. Mm -hmm. The generations in the workforce, those are all coming together to create what they call this perfect storm that's creating this environment for the foreseeable future. Now what's going to happen is you're in a kind of this big reset phase and so now that's why people are worried about what's going to happen to jobs with this automation pace continues, right? All those things 
are on the table as this new technology wave comes into play and gets implemented. This has happened before in the history of, of our country and most economies, and it's a big adjustment and a lot of things shift, right? New ways of work happen, all kinds of things take place. So I just want you guys to be thinking about some of these kinds of things. We've talked about Moore's Law plenty of times. Gordon Moore, founder of Intel, says that um, technology will continue to double every 18 months. Now Dan Burris, who we worked with, actually said that's been accelerated. It's not just processing power, but it's processing power plus what else is doubling every year pretty much? Bandwidth, right? 4G, 5G, 6G, every time that is double. And then the other one is storage, data storage. So those three digital accelerators are continuing at exponential paces. And there's no end in sight. Now, we've talked about the power of exponential change before and what that means. And the danger is when exponential change is at work, in the early phases, it looks like linear change. And so many of us have been in a position where, how many times have you said, ah, that's, that cloud, that's not going to happen. That's going to take years to happen, right? Because in, our, in many of our years, especially as older folks, that's how change happened. It didn't happen that fast, correct? Mm -hmm. Things would be announced, and it would take years for things to filter through and get adopted. But in an age of technology, that's not necessarily true. So the thing you have to watch is linear change. And we've used this example, 30 steps linear. If I take 30 steps, how far do I go? Many of you have heard this before. I hope you remember. What's 30 times roughly what? A yard? 30 yards. If I take 30 steps exponentially, how far will I travel? I knew you didn't remember anything I said. 30 steps exponentially. So here's, right, it goes 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, right? It's about like, like chips, 256, 512, 1024, 30 times. What do you get to? Big number. <laughs> big number. Really big number. Billion. A billion. And then after 30 to 31, what's it come to? 2 billion, right? 31 to 32 is 4 billion. Do you see how that accelerator happens when it gets up in the top? So we're now 50 years into the technology curve at that pace. We're 50 steps into doubling of processing power. That's why when you look at your smartphones, those of you who have them, <laughs> have more power than all those computers that were in the Houston Space Center when they sent the Apollo up in your hand versus rooms of computers. See the difference? That's exponential change. So what worries me is we have to now watch because the pace of change that appears to be linear, if it's exponential in your industry, it's going to happen overnight, right? And we've used these examples before, but Airbnb took six years to get a million properties under management. Hotels now, it's, by the way, it took Marriott, which is right down the street, and Hilton, which are both right down the street. It took them 100 years to get a million hotels under management. And now what the stats are, I just saw this the other day, in markets where Airbnb is popular, they're experiencing a 10% reduction in, in, room rate, in room occupancy already. Six years for a group of kids who just wanted a place to stay during the World Cup games to disrupt an entire industry. Think about that. Taxi cabs, they're fighting like crazy right now, right, to stop Uber everywhere they are. And yet Uber has more black cars in Manhattan than yellow taxis. And yellow cab franchises have lost like 50% of their value in major markets where Uber is, a, is around, Chicago and New York in particular. That's what we call exponential change, right? A hundred years to get a million rooms traditionally, six years with technology. So I think that's what we have to be watching, and that's certainly what we're watching on your behalf, to see how this is all going to impact us. And it's continuing to happen. Now there's also the flip side of that, is there's tons of opportunity in that for all of us. So opportunities to say, how can I harness 
some of these trends to actually make them work for me and with me or with my clients if you're in the uh, practice environment. This is another one. This is uh, Pierre from uh, Accenture. Digital is the main reason that just over half the companies on the Fortune 500 have disappeared since the year 2000. Think about that. It is hard to believe, isn't it? They're just gone, like, pff, yeah. gone. So think about that kind of, that's disruption, right? That's what we mean about the waves getting bigger. Because if they can take down a, a pretty sophisticated company, like overnight, it's been on that Fortune 500 list, that's pretty scary. So we, gotta, we can't take these waves for granted from that perspective. Now this one I thought was fascinating. So you want to say like how far technology's come. They took a 3D printer, they printed a house and a car with one 3D printer. And the car and the house actually share energy together. They actually create energy and can share it with each other because they're made of carbon fiber. Now, they did that, that's going to disrupt at least three industries, right? Think about construction and building industry, suppliers, supply chain, unskilled labor, because we can print the building and assemble it right on the parking lot. That's what they did. It's going to disrupt the automotive and transportation industry, including components makers, assembly lines, and the people that would ship the materials to the job site. Because all you got to ship is the raw materials that go into the printer. And then the electric utilities industry, because these things are actually net power makers, not power consumers. Is that crazy? That's real today. That's not like in the future science fiction. It just happened a couple months ago. So that's what we mean by the, like this pace of change. This stuff's getting kind of interesting and real. I think in China, they actually put a 3D printer on a big empty parking lot and printed a whole building out of it. Everything, right? All the materials came out of that one printer. Where they're printing body parts, like ears and organs. They're printing meat. You can, like, now we can go buy a steak and just have it printed at your house. <laughs> Ew. You better start checking your restaurant. Has any of this food been 3D printed? <laughs> so it's kind of crazy. And then we've had this stat um, plenty of times, right? This comes from an uh, Oxford study uh, a while back. It's been widely distributed. And this is Oxford University. So we've talked about this a lot, right? When I look at trends, I try to put them in context. So first of all, I try to triangulate trends. If I see a trend written up by one group, and then I see it another group, kind of something similar, then I go, OK, it's time to pay attention. This is Oxford University. So it didn't come from like Wired Magazine or some high-tech think tank. It came from Oxford University. It was first published in The Economist magazine, which is kind of a very conservative global magazine. So when you started looking at that, you're like, wow, this is pretty interesting. They ranked the professions and jobs for disruption by machines. They called it complete automation in 20 years. And so we happened to be in the top four. We actually came in second and fourth in the most likely to be automated. Do you know who was above us, the only one worse than us? Retail sales. Telesales, actually, telesales, not retail. So 98.7% chance for tax preparers to be automated and 93.5% for auditors and accountants to be automated. Now what's that mean? Does that mean you don't have a job anymore? What do you think? So Rick says you better have a different job. Who else? What else do you think about that? Will you be completely automated by machine in 20 years? Not if you're smart, right? But go ahead. So for you guys on the studio audience, you couldn't hear that, but, he, but what he's saying is you're, you know, you're, many of your functions will be automated, but the things that you should be using your brain for, analyzing and figuring out and communicating what the numbers mean, et cetera, that will be the area that you'll be able to do more of. How many of us feel like we're a slave to getting the numbers done right now? Am I right? I mean, when I was a CFO, it was everything we could do to get the numbers right. And how many times did the CEO come in and start asking questions, and you're like, God, I wish I had had time to analyze it ahead of time because I would have anticipated some of those questions and been ready to give them more value add. That's what you really want to do. That's what you were trained to do. 
but we're slaves to getting the numbers right, getting the reports out, right? If you're an SEC company, getting SEC stuff out, taxes, all that, right? Statutory stuff we have to do. Then the standards change, we have to figure that out. And that, none of that adds value to the information of running the business technically. So I think this is an area where this is actually a positive in my mind, but you better make sure you're not stuck doing routine work that can be automated because <laughs> that's going to start like a big Pac-Man. It's going to start getting eaten up as things move forward. That's what we're seeing in this environment. Does that make sense? And that's true if you're in practice, not-for-profit government stuff. You're just moving numbers around. That's the area most likely to be disrupted. This is the study we talked about. So nationally, CPAs across the country from the AICPA said that 92% of them were not future ready. You guys said that, so that's 8% are future ready. You guys said 6% of you are future ready. So you got some work to do. And so this is where you have to watch, right? Because you're in an environment where you don't have enough time. That's your number one issue, continuously. So you don't have enough time, and the waves of change are coming at you faster. So what are you going to do? Because the time of sitting still, every year, that pace of change accelerates, right? And that's what I worry about for many of us. We've got to somehow figure out how to ride that wave instead of getting knocked over. Because by the time you get knocked over by one, the next one coming is going to be bigger. Right? And faster. And that's what we have to be watching. So that's the notion of future ready. This is another one from World Economic Forum. Um, during the fourth industrial revolution, we will experience endless waves of disruption. And complacency can be the kiss of death. And I think that's true, right? We would actually say in the business world, mediocrity is the biggest thing that we would be fighting. And this, by the way, ties into engagement of your employees. We'll talk about more of those things as we get into this today as well. Questions or comments? Is there anything in conferences I.O. I haven't checked recently? You guys have any questions or comments about what we're talking about? So again, you can go there. Oh, let's see. There are some questions. Do we have Wi-Fi? <laughs> I should have answered that a little longer. Yeah, you do have Wi-Fi. J.H.U. Guest is the Wi-Fi. And uh, you do have to log in with your email address, right? So make sure you put your email address in when the browser comes up. So we got that one. Uh, no other designations. I guess that's a comment. I'm going to check off what right here. I keep hearing from my peers, you all, in the age range of 40 to 60, that they're going out, of their, out on their own to provide outsourced accounting. Was it always like this, or is this a new trend in the past five years or so? I feel like it's more and more people. So the answer to that is absolutely yes. We're seeing business and industry members who either retire or get displaced from a company start their own outsourced CFO. Sometimes like CFO, I'll do your CFO for a small group for one year, another one, you know, for one day a week, and another one another day a week, right? That's what you do, Kelly. Um, so yeah, comment on this too. For, but yeah, we're, this is the fastest growing segment of the practice side of our profession. 92% growth in the last four years in this segment called outsource accounting or CFO advisory services. Business process outsourcing is the other term of art for that notion. Is that accurate? Yeah. I think, Jack, isn't that what you're starting to do too? Anyone else? How many people are doing that, by the way, in here? So look around the room. If you guys want to connect each other, break. I mean, maybe we should start a little group about that because that is a fast growing segment. Anyhow, that is absolutely the fastest growing segment in our profession. Um, so know that social media is very important to be effective in today's environment. So I'm thinking that's just a comment, and I would say I vitally agree with that. Social media is an intense way of learning, keeping up on trends, right? Finding out what's coming at you, connecting to people. You know, everyone says, well, you can't connect to anyone on social media. And uh, <laughs> Kelly's like, what the heck? The answer is, yeah, you can. Actually, what we find is what we call that micro connection of a tweet or a Twitter connection or a LinkedIn connection or a Facebook connection. Then when that person meets you in person, they actually feel like they know you. It actually triggers a recognition, not unlike when you've actually physically met someone the first time. So have you ever been to an event and you meet someone for the first time, 
right? And you're like, okay, I recognize you now. I, I got this connection. The next time, it's a better connection, right? I could, yeah, remember David, we met. And right. so the social media gives you an edge on that because it provides that little connection. And believe it or not, from a brain perspective, your brain is actually processing that quicker and making that connection for you. So when you see them physically, you feel like you know them and that trust level goes up. So it can actually speed up the ability to do business with someone. It also gives you the ability to learn a little bit about them ahead of time uh, if you so choose. So social media, a great, great idea from that standpoint. Playing with social media instead of performing the task is frustrating for us wanting to hear the session content. Let's go already. <laughs> <laughs> you guys just don't know what you're missing. Uh, how much is the product offering changing? I might need someone to tell me that product offering of what? CPAs? The association? What are we, what are we talking about? Anyone want to tell me what that meant? It could have been from the uh, studio audience. All right, we're going to hold that one. I won't collect that one. In. If growth is exponential, then is diversification and generalization dying? Well, diversification is not dying. Actually, that's continuing. But generalization is dying, right? Because the idea that you can be a generalist and knowledgeable about a whole big field of stuff is changing pretty dramatically, right? We're seeing specialization in everything that we do. So as bodies of knowledge get deeper and more specialized, that's what's driving that in the profession as well as other areas also. What should CPAs stop doing to be future ready? What do you guys think? What should you stop doing to be future ready? Any ideas? Well, anyone stopping anything right now? Stop learning? <laughs> I think that's a little dangerous. So here's what we're seeing, right? What you should stop doing, first of all, is can you create capacity by automating some pieces of your business? I'm going to give you our case study to show you how we've approached that. But the answer is with technology, there are little steps you can take that will then free up time to create more room for other things. So you're going to have to get smart about what could I do to be more effective at something that might create a little bit of time to reinvest in something proactive. Does that make sense? But you're going to have to start somewhere and unfortunately there's no easy way. It actually takes a net use of time to probably get started in whatever you're doing from that standpoint. But we'll talk more about that. Any other ideas from the audience from that standpoint? By the way, you guys can actually put comments I think in on these. Uh, let's see. And then, all right, so I think we got them all. We got the generalization product thing. All right, good. So you guys are, are getting this. You're using this the right way. Okay. So this was a Forbes article not too long ago. Uh, the coming, uh, the headlines were caught my attention, right? Coming demise and rebirth of the accounting profession. This is Robo Advisor. It's a, it's a stock market advisor that's disrupting personal financial planning in the CPA profession side. And that is starting to automate a whole lot of stuff. And that's what's creating some worry about this. But this was, uh, again, a Forbes uh, editor that uh, coined that headline. This one's the one that's kind of gotten the most interesting discussion. I was at New York on Monday at the AICPA Regional Council meeting with our Maryland delegation group. And there was a whole lot of talk about IBM Watson and KPMG. So anyone heard that? Anyone heard that headline not too long ago? So a couple. So you guys are going to have to step up your game in terms of scanning for this stuff. It was hit, it hit Wall Street Journal. It was all over LinkedIn uh, and some other areas. Anyhow, auditing firms count on technology for backup. They are now deploying IBM Watson to do audit work at KPMG. The other big three, the other of the big four, are all investing in similar technology. This isn't just like straight automation. This is cognitive computing. Right? And we've talked about IBM Watson a bit here, but here's the deal. Cognitive computing has three unique abilities. Natural language processing, hypothesis generation and evaluation, and dynamic learning. So what KPMG is doing is they're actually feeding all of the accounting and audit standards to Watson to read those. Now last year we told the story of Watson reading a million cookbooks in one second. One <coughs> second. And creating a unique recipe out of it, right? That's, that was the story that we've got. Now what they're doing is feeding all that to Watson. Then when they audit a company, 
they're going to feed Watson all of the contracts that the company has with its customers so that Watson can analyze every contract, not the statistical sample, and it's going to do that in a day. How long would it take an audit team to do that? 100% of the contracts of AT&T. Months. Months, right? <laughs> if they could ever do that. So it's going to do that in a day. It's going to make, it's going to look for patterns and assumptions. It's going to create a hypothesis and say, these contracts look like they're out of sync with the rest. Here's what you should be looking at. And they're going to come up with a, an audit program that says, here we should do. In fact, one group is actually feeding all of the transactions to Watson and telling Watson to recreate the financial statements as if they were preparing them as KPMG and then comparing those final statements to the client and looking for the variances. And they could do that in a day. How long would it take auditors to do that? Like everybody's looking at me like, are you kidding me? That's true. <laughs> and next year, guess what? That day will be a half a day. And the year after that, it'll be a quarter day, right? It's going to continue to double from that standpoint. So that's, that's like crazy. And in the article in the Wall Street Journal, CFO Magazine had a big article about this, by the way, the demise of auditors. What they said is they're going to have to repurpose their entire skill set of their professionals because of this. Right? Because remember how we used to spend all of our time doing the manual postings and, and doing the, right? That's how we learned our profession. They aren't going to have time to do that anymore because they're going to come hit the ground and the computer's doing that. They're going to have to be ready to communicate and add value. So they talked about a lot of the skills that they're going to need that are different than what they are now. We're already seeing that in entry level skills and professionals. All of our corporations and all of our audit firms are telling us the young people aren't prepared for the job. How many of you guys have seen that? Young people coming in out of college, are they job ready? No, what are they lacking? Experience. experience, but the experience actually isn't in accounting necessarily. Most of it's in communication or collaboration or they don't know Excel real well, right? It's all those kinds of things. So those skills are now demanded at earlier and earlier levels of our careers. And we haven't, we've kind of missed how that impact is working. Now, how are we going to train you know, the greenhorns to understand auditing when they aren't auditing? <laughs> right? They're not doing the grunt work that we used to use as the training ground. And in your companies, the ones that are helping balance the trial balances and do the correcting entries and all that stuff, right? what are we going to do if that is done by machines? It's going to be interesting, right? We're going to have to change the way learning. Obviously, the Educational system's going to have to change, but that's going to take a while, I believe. So, um, so this is real now. This is not like Star Wars. This is going on right now. In fact, Dan Burris, the guy we've talked about, right, he's the one that put IBM, Watson, and KPMG together and gave him that idea two years ago at a partner meeting. So he, using the hard trend idea, they figured it out, and that's what they did. Yeah. So Rick said DOD is doing the same thing with procurement regulations, right? Because so they can read every contract, every regulation, and then they can analyze whatever they want. But it, the computer can do that in fractions of, of minutes rather than days and days and days of the old people reading and making notes and tying it. And they're saying that the, the, the regs are so complex that no one person can know them all. Yeah. All. Right. So the regs, so for you guys in the studio audience, the regs are so complex that no one person can know them all and figure it out. That's, but they believe Watson can. IBM Watson, by the way, is interesting because IBM is using that and renting it out at very, very inexpensive rates. So they're actually letting companies submit data to it on a trial basis as if it's a cloud subscription. So in the old days, you had to like proprietary own the big supercomputer and it was stored in a secure place and no one could get to it. It's a different world now where they're actually making this technology available to more and more people. It's doing all kinds of things in the healthcare industry they're using Watson from that standpoint. So, you know, this is where I think we have to be watching is that app, app to hit any of our industries. The oil and gas companies, we've talked about this before, Hughes and uh, Shell Oil are using artificial intelligence to do all their internal auditing uh, analysis, and they've automated a big chunk of their back office accounting from that standpoint. So, lots of internal auditors were displaced from that perspective. Questions, comments, what do you guys think? Real or not? 
Yeah, this is the first time we were in New York. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for pointing out. So this is where the other thing, like what we're seeing right now is the collaboration curve. So right, we tossed out this idea. Rick talks about the DOD. He talks about Go. You guys have knowledge right, that we could all use from that standpoint. So that's the other thing. If you guys see articles, many of you do this already. If you see good articles or stuff around this stuff, email it to me, tom at macpa.org, or tweet it. I know I'm annoying you guys who don't <laughs> like social media. Uh, tweet it. And uh, we'll be able to get that out to folks. But uh, Go, yeah, that was on my radar as well. Go, anyone know about the ancient game of Go? Anyone play Go, by the way? No. So you do? You do? So they, they say it's like more complicated than chess by a big degree. And Google's uh, AI machine just beat Go, as you said, four out of five times games against like the, the international Go master. And, uh, and so that's Google's on the same track as Watson. So it's not like one company's got the game on this, right? There's a bunch of this stuff going on that's just mind boggling in what it can do. And where it ends, no one knows, right? Because they're starting to re, when you start to talk about the internet of things and how everything's connected, that's where the supercomputing takes on a whole nother lesson. Yeah, Gus. That was Watson. Yeah, uh, but still, nonetheless, uh, just on the average, that they're where humans are still superior in a matter of what is in is uh, you, you, is in intuition, which is something which is still cannot be quantified. Yeah. So that's I think that's the one thing we humans have left. <laughs> <laughs> so, gosh, you make a great point, right? There's a, so. Um, Jeff, so here's a couple, a couple books for you guys, anyone who wants to kind of keep on top of this stuff. Age of the Second Machine, I think one of the best books. Uh, it's by Eric Brynolfsson and um, Andrew McAfee, who were uh, MIT uh, computer PhDs, and they wrote about how this machine exponential thing's going and what they think the impact on society and what you should be thinking about from your own skills and career from that standpoint. The other one that came out recently is Humans Are Underrated, which is exactly what you're talking about. Jeff Colvin, he's the editor, I believe, of Fortune, wrote that book just a little while ago, Humans Are Underrated, and he says the competitive advantage is in empathy and intuition. Mm -hmm. By the way, computers can't collaborate well. Like, they can connect to each other, but they can't leverage each other ideas and come up with a new idea. So I could sit down with you, Rachel, and say, here's my idea, here's your idea, let's make a better idea. Computers don't have that capability right now. Uh, that gets into the idea of intuition. Trust, by the way, is the other thing. People don't necessarily trust computers and robots very well. Uh, so humans are where that trust relationship makes a big difference. So as long as you're the interpreter right, of what the machine is doing, you're going to always have a place. But that means what skills are more valuable? Communication, right? relationship building. Collaboration, creativity, those are the skills that are actually going to be the money skills in addition to your technical knowledge, but you're going to be using computers for a lot more and more of that technical knowledge. Does that make sense? That's what we think is going to be happening more and more as this stuff moves on. So great comment back there, Gus. Thank you. So again, this is where you guys have the wisdom of the crowd coming along. All right, a couple more and then we're going to take a break. So I like to say, are we at a strategic inflection point? This was coined, by the way, by, uh, by uh, Andy Grove, the CEO of Intel, as Intel was getting disrupted. This is a long time ago. And he wrote a book called Only the Paranoid Survive, which I think is probably more true today than it was back in, like, 85 when he wrote that. So he likes to talk about an inflection point is the point in the life of a business or industry when its fundamentals are about to change. It's an engineering term when the, the sine curve moves either up or down, right, in two different directions. And so he says it's at that point when everything's changing that you can actually figure out how to leverage that stuff and have a new rise 
or you could just as likely go down and get disrupted, right? That's what he would say. And I think as we enter this VUCA exponential age even more, we have to be watching for that, right? Because now a decision that says I stand still could cost you money that wouldn't normally be the case, right? I like to call it the risk of not investing. In other words, if you say, I'm not going to do this, I'm going to ignore this cloud thing, in a year, that could be a fatal decision. Whereas in the old days, it would just be, a, if I don't do it, I'm not going to spend any money, I'm, it's a no-brainer, no right? It's not going to impact me. But now, other disruptions that could happen com competition-wise could actually change your game. So you want to be thinking about that. And as CPAs, one of the things, we are often called the CF knows. <laughs> That's what they call us, right? CF no. So you're the one who always gets to say, no, we're not going to do that. No, we're not going to spend that money. No, we're not going to do that. I would say that's still good. You have to be objective, and that's legit. But you should also be asking, what happens if we say no? Like, what is the potential implication of not investing on that decision? Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think that's what we have to start, because now you're in an environment where the speed of change could make those decisions. That gap gets wider faster. Whereas in the old days, it might take years for that competitive thing to hit you. Now it could happen in a year or two. See that? that that's the gap you've got to watch. So in a period of accelerating change, the gaps in this inflection point notion widen faster. Agree? OK. So I'm going to talk about this is the flip side of this, right? Big waves of change and oceans of opportunity. So there's lots of good news going on that make us go, how can we harness this technology? We've been through technology disruption as a profession before, right? When I entered the profession, it was the age of the PC. And there's PC and the network PCs, we have the mainframes. How many of you guys ever fed cards to a big, giant main mainframe? Remember those days? Oh my god, so we, so we survived that, right? That was horrible days when you look back. He's like, I love those days. Uh, the, uh, I'll never forget, I was feeding, I was at a, at a, a, a press, it was Waverly Wilkins press group, and we had this big mainframe, we had to do allocations across like 70 periodicals that we were allocating cost. So we had this deck, we'd actually put all the allocations in, and they'd come out and they'd give me this big deck of cards, and I had to take it to the IT center, and then they would feed it, and then overnight, it took all night for that to run, right, to allocate across, you know, 100 things. And, uh, I was on call that night, so I had to sit by the bed. And that time, I didn't have a mobile phone, so you had to sit by the phone and wait for the phone to ring. And they say, oh, the thing's screwed up. you got to come down here and put the cards back. So like, because what happened is when they had a mistake, the cards would spit out. Remember that? <laughs> and when they spat out, they were all out of order. And then the only one that knew, how, knew the order was you as the accountant that put all that together. So then I have to like get up, get my clothes on, drive downtown, and sit there and start picking all the cards up off the floor and put them back in order again. <laughs> Find out what was wrong, then reallocate. Right. And then. It was great for football things that Yeah, it's true. All those cards. My mother was a data entry. She still has cards at home that she takes notes on, those little uh, IBM cards. So um, anyhow, we've been, we've been through this and we've worked it. So here's the good news, right? 91% of CPA firms are expecting record hiring uh, in the next couple years. 11% projected uh, job growth in accounting for the next 10 years, 2014 to 2024, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Here's what's interesting. If you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics projections, bookkeeping is going down. Interesting, right? Yeah. So accounting is growing, but bookkeeping is going down. So what's happening is the knowledge is what people are going to want and pay for compiling the data. They show like a 15% decline in bookkeepers under those statistics. Interesting. So um, demand for accounting, again, 38% of employers internationally are reporting talent shortages. We've been telling you that. It's going to get worse. It continues. Look at the growth rate. 30% in 09, 38% in 15. It's going to keep going up. So if you're not watching your human capital, you're going to be in shock, right? Number one job in demand in accounting and finance and it's the eighth worst job in talent shortages. What's worse than accounting and finance? Medical and technology. They're the only two that are ahead of us right now. Otherwise, we'd be up in the top. And so in the business class, we're the worst in terms of shortage. In the, in the other professions, when you throw in uh, health and tech, it gets a little, uh, we look a little better. 
10 best jobs in America. I love this, right? We've, ne we've never been consistently ranked one of the best jobs. We're the second of the top 10 by US News and World Report. We're in the top 20 happiest professions. Are you guys all happy? Are you happy? <laughs> we we're happy, you're a happy bunch. I love coming out here and seeing you guys. So we're one of the happiest professions. By the way, uh, they, happiness is a big indicator right now. And we're in the top 10 in demand jobs and hardest to fill jobs by Manpower Group. That was that number eight statistic. The best jobs, by the way, are ranked based on pay and stress level. How about that? So you guys make a lot of money for that little bit of stress that you have to deal with. <laughs> Hopefully you make a lot of money for the lot of stress you have to deal with, right? That would be, make that a little better. Uh, so I think, there's a, so this is like some really good news about our profession from that standpoint. Um, by the way, those of you who are small businesses as CPA practices or consultants, you are the most profitable industry according to SageWorks data most recently, and you're the biggest growth area in small to mid-sized businesses. So those of you who are actually practicing as a accountant, CPA, financial advisor, consultant, you're actually theoretically the most profitable and the fastest growing, 12% growth, not too shabby. First time ever we beat um, back people, who are the back? chiropractors. I was gonna say acupuncturists. Ch chiropractors are consistently the most profitable small business there is, every year. This is the first year we ever beat them. Isn't that cool? And I think that speaks to the thing that somebody had in the conferences I.O., that this growth area and the new way of serving, consulting, CFO advisor, business process outsourcing, et cetera, is the more profitable way to go for those of you who are trying to start your own business. Now, here's the thing for us to pay attention to as business and industry members. It used to be it was the hard assets we had to worry about, right? That how much time do we spend doing capital asset, you know, fixed asset ledgers and stuff for the auditors, receivables, payable, like all those kind of things. Look at the flip from 1975 to 2010 in terms of the valuation of public companies and what's creating the value. It isn't assets anymore, right? It's all about intangibles. So 80% intangible assets are creating value when in 75 it was the exact opposite. None of the major industrial players are at the top of the corporate list anymore, right? Exxon, GM, Dow Chemical, those folks aren't in the top. It's Google and Apple and those kinds of companies that are all based on intangibles, Amazon, et cetera. So what's that implication for your businesses, right? You might say, I'm just a little small business. I don't have that big brand identity, all that. But you do have customer value, and your customer base is valuable. And you do have employee base that's valuable. So those human capital elements and social capital elements and non-hard assets are now something we have to start thinking about more as CPAs in business and industry, government, not-for-profit. Does that make sense? Any examples of that? Are any of you guys dealing with this kind of stuff where you're starting to spend more time starting to think about these kinds of metrics? By the way, we're gonna show this a little bit later, how you need to start thinking about what are the metrics that I need to be tracking. You know, I know how to track inventory turns, but how do I track human capital, both internally as an asset or customer capital from that perspective, right? How am I doing that? What's the value of my customer base and all that? Any examples from the audience on any of that stuff? Does that make sense? So this is where you have to start paying attention because more and more as the technology thing moves, this is what's driving value. Airbnb doesn't own anything <clears throat> other than people, right? And maybe a little bit of code. That's what they're doing, right? Same with uh, Uber. So this is the accounting one I think we talked about. 91% growth in those advisory services, right? That's huge in four years. That's the number one growth segment in the traditional profession. Tax at 17% and auditing and accounting at 6%. If you were to predict what's going to happen to that auditing stream as automation hits, what are you going to see? What's it going to do? How much? Who said? Smaller, right? It's going to go down. It's got to. It's going to be automated. And then the question is, how do you redo the business model? The big four are right now struggling with What's the business model? Because it used to be a pyramid. Well, the pyramid gets changed dramatically if that entry-level stuff is all being done by a computer now, correct? Mm -hmm. 
they're struggling, many firms are struggling with, and many firms don't know they're going to be disrupted, but they're going to get disrupted pretty bad as that stuff moves downstream quicker. Because here's the other thing about this exponential change. I remember when I was a CFO in industry, I used to always look at like, you know, what some of the larger corporates were doing to see is there things that we should be emulating in terms of what we did in our asphalt business, you know, from best practices and things like that. And it would take years for something that showed up in Harvard Business Review to actually move down like balanced scorecard into the mainstream, right? Remember that? Years. Mm -hmm. Now it's moving like lightning, right? That's the difference. So you read it yesterday in HBR, and in three months, there's an app for it on your smartphone that you could get for $3.99. That's the difference, right? So if you're not paying attention to some of these trends and what they might mean, you again, you're going to be missing that, right, and getting swamped by those waves. Comments or questions? All right, this is kind of fun too, right? We're seeing this huge impact of CFOs becoming COOs and CEOs. How many of you guys are C acting as COOs also? Anyone? Couple? How about CEOs? How about any of you guys who are CEOs who were are, are CFOs? You back there? Like we watched Marriott, their new CEO was their CFO, Arn Sorensen. Harley Davidson a while back, Rich Tierlink, came out of their accounting, was their CFO, became the CEO of Harley Davidson. Oracle, their new CEO, Safra Katz, was their CFO. That never happened before. How many of that did we see in the old days? So we're seeing more and more articles about that, again, if you have the right skill set. So this is where you have to be saying, what skills do I need if I aspire to those kinds of spots from that standpoint? And then this uh, kind of sums it up. I added that last one. Harvard didn't have my bullet on there. Um, but I think this is appropriate, right? This was HBR a little while back. The new rules of competition, be paranoid, disrupt yourself before someone else does, right? So Dan Burris has a saying that says, if it can be done, it will be done. And if you don't do it, someone else will. And I think that's true more and more today, right? If it can be done, it will be done. If you don't do it, somebody else will. So that's where we have to be thinking about that. Yeah, David. Related to the rules of competition, can you make some comments about uh, our new competitor, or the competitor H&R Block? Ah, yes. I, mean, I, we'll do, we'll do, I heard one of their commercials this morning on the radio, and I was, this is the first time I heard it. I've read it, but it's absolutely disgraceful what they do to the profession. It is. In, in, in a very underhanded way. Yep. I, to that's, the public. I'm going to come, we're going to come back to that right after break. Make sure you remind me if I forget. Uh, but you're right. That's an interesting one. And we just talked about that at Regional in New York. We had members that reached out to me right away. WTOP is running it a lot down in this market. WMAL and uh, so we've written a letter to Block. We have a great blog post. I'll have Edith tweet it out. Uh, again, for those of you who are on social media, if you're not, you're missing out. Uh, did you like that? That was our, our response. So let's take a 15 minute break. Stop over and see our sponsor over there, Tyler. Make sure you show him some love. And uh, if you want a demo of our uh, Burris Learning System, our team is around so they can boot up a laptop and show you what that looks like and then be back at 15 after, by the way, studio audience. So quarter after, be back, ready to roll. Thank you. All right, I got a couple more questions. Hopefully our webcast audience is back. For those on the webcast, it'd be great to hear the audience comments and questions. So um, what we could do is try to run the mic around or and or use your outside voices. <laughs> so, uh, so go ahead and speak up. I will do my best webcast audience. I'm trying to repeat, I'll repeat the questions and the answers uh, if we don't, can't get the mic uh, to the right folks. So uh, apologies for that. Uh, in the future, we'll need good communicators and collaborators. How do we grow those people when we are teleworking, texting, working remotely, webcasting, web conferencing, and not having as many face-to-face -face experiences in our daily work life. That sounds like a baby boomer. Um, the answer is, you're right, it's and, not or. So the, the point is, you want to start maximizing the in-person time and make it highly valuable and engaging and meaningful so that you can supplement the web time. We'll talk a little bit later about purpose 
and values and some of those ways of engaging that, we're actually beginning to start working on remote leadership courses. How do you lead and manage remote teams? Because that's the environment that we're in. So the answer is it can be done, it is being done. And so uh, you want to be thinking about that. So rather than saying, you know, this is all bad, what can we do? So the key is maximizing those pieces and engaging people in those events, but making sure you're getting out to some, some events live so that you can actually make those physical connections. Um, with generalization dying at some point, how will the perceived value of the overarching designation CPA not be surpassed by the perceived value of the other professional designations discussed earlier? This is a very good question because it's not unlike the medical profession. And one of my fears for us as a profession is what happened to docs doesn't happen to us. So the medical profession, as it began to specialize, and I know a lot of my colleagues in the medical profession, so you've got like the eye, ear, and nose profession, the surgical, the orthopedics, the pediatricians. You could go down the long list of, of medical specialties who all have associations. And what happened through the, actually it was going on since the 70s and 80s, as specializations occurred, the AMA lost its core membership of docs, American Medical Association. That's the reason they lost their voice in healthcare reform. They lost their voice in employer paid plans back in the 80s, and then they lost their voice completely by the time they got into the um, healthcare that we're dealing with right now. They have no voice because they lost the strength of their profession in numbers as a united profession. So our hope would be that the CPA designation is always the top trusted one, but we're seeing signs of stress cracks on that right now. Only one in three people that pass the CPA, I mean pass accounting, go in to become CPAs. That's horrible. So we're trying to fix that. We're doing a lot. We'll talk about that at the end of today, some of the pipeline initiatives. But the fact is we've got to try to keep the luster on the CPA and we have to try to expand our numbers. We're going to talk a little bit about CGMA and what we're doing both nationally with the AICPA is leading, but what we're doing in Maryland as well because we think we want to be shifting from a CPA only profession to a CPA led profession. See that distinction? So that we will have some CGMAs who are not CPAs potentially in our midst as this next round of, of change goes on and that if we stay united we'll have the strength in numbers as a total profession. But if we don't then we risk becoming more and more narrow and losing our clout in the marketplace. So um, that's critical. Well, I'm going to get to the block thing in a minute. Will there be another opportunity to attain the CGMA without an exam? I wish. It's, <laughs> no. I mean, they've already made that choice. They started in 12. They gave us a three-year ramp up for people to be grandfathered in. And, uh, and now the door, the window closed, and now you've got to sit for that exam. So unfortunately, that's the deal. We can't hear the speaker. Is that in this room, or is that from the webcast audience. Is that, did any of you guys say you couldn't hear me? Usually I'm loud enough. The, the mic that they gave us for internal here didn't work real well. Can the webcast audience hear me, Dan? Do you think they're okay? Oh, a comment. Okay, got it. So we're, we're going to be more conscious of that. Question for Tom on the new rules of competition slide. What do you mean by saying be paranoid? What do you think I mean? <laughs> In other words, you have to be vigilant. Maybe that's a better word than Andy Groh's word. You have to be thinking, what's going to disrupt me and how do I get ahead of it? Right? I think that's the different mindset. If you're thinking about technology, you need to be paranoid of what would Watson do. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, trends and what we've been doing with Dan to give you the idea of how do you forecast potential disruptions before they disrupt and take advantage of that. And that's where we've... We've got a learning system that actually teaches you how to do that. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. But be paranoid means really be keeping watching the waves coming at you, not the shore. What are CPA associations doing to collaborate with other related professional associations for advocacy and other bigger issues? I will tell you that when I talk to you about our uh, advocacy update. We collaborate with a whole lot of groups as well as the AICPA does at a national level. And again, we're trying to continue to do that to the extent possible. So we'll. We'll give you an update of that perspective as well. Another question is, what kind of software are these organizations using to do cognitive computing for those of us looking for ways to do this? 
So I would say Google cognitive computing, computing. Certainly IBM Watson, I should get a sponsorship from IBM Watson. IBM Watson is, uh, does have cloud subscription things you can do. Actually, you can also join IBM Watson's Cognitive Cooking Club, where IBM Watson takes those million cookbooks and gives you creative recipes to think about. So um, you can friend IBM Watson. I, my social media haters aren't going to like this, but IBM Watson is on social media and on Twitter. Uh, so the handle is at IBM Watson, in case you want to friend IBM Watson. Uh, so I would look at IBM Watson, and there are others, so just start to Google that. Obviously, when Google starts moving on this, you'll see more of that. How do we get involved in the decision regarding the change from the CPA Association to the CPA-led association? It's concerning that this may water down the designation. If you want to see me, we'll talk to you. Our board has already approved part of this, but we will be um, socializing this over the town hall season. But see me up here at the end. Give me your card, and we'll uh, reach out to you from that standpoint. What kind of software are these organizations using? Oh, we already did that one. So I think I got them all. Let's see, I'm checking them off. In the future, we already talked about good communicators and remote working. Okay, any live questions before I answer the HR Block question? All right, how many people saw the HR Block ad? So decent amount, or heard it, right? Saw or heard, so decent amount. We got emails from members about a week ago, which we then, immediately work with the AICPA to say, hey, what are you guys doing about this so we can coordinate efforts? The AICPA heard from us in South Carolina, apparently we're the two markets that it started in. So um, Barry Melanson wrote a letter, the CEO of the AICPA, to Block's CEO. We did a blog post and got our uh, executive committee to approve a letter, which is going out this week, which we will publish. So we will be writing a letter similar to that. Um, one member said, why don't you get a, cease, a lawyer and get a cease and desist? The reality is, how many uh, false ads do you see on TV every day? <laughs> so, so, what is, so the question is, what do they say? They basically say, um, not all CPAs specialize in tax. And HR Block is giving you a cheaper, better experience. Not all CPAs will come let you come in face to face. Like so it was a whole bunch of disparaging things about our profession. Uh, yeah, David. There was one other thing they, they implied that the CPA wouldn't stand behind you. Right. Work. Right. Their work. Right. They imply the CPA won't stand behind you work with the IRS. Only a company like HR Block will. Right. <laughs> wink, wink. So, so uh, needless to say, not, not to mention that Block owned one of the largest CPA firms in the world, RSM McLadry, a couple years ago. Like we, they didn't mention any of that. And that they have plenty of CPAs, 3,000 CPAs, actually working for them. So they did trash the profession pretty well. Um, Barry wrote a letter and said, you know, this is bad. This is bad to do this. Why don't you stop? Um, the block guy wrote back and said, um, in a very taunting way, it's all in accounting today, uh, but he basically wrote back and said, well, now that you recognize us as legitimate because you're worried about us, I'm going to actually increase the ads to annoy you more. That's what he's going to do. So we're going to publish, in fact, our blog post. So Edith, we'll, we'll email this as part of the follow-up to this thing. Our blog post actually has a letter, sample letter that you could write. So if every, if every CPA in the world starts writing letters to block, I think it will have an impact. And certainly tell all your friends and family um, that they're jerks. On our tax listserv, it's been lit up with examples of, yeah, I got block clients that you know, are all screwed up and I'm trying to help fix. So you know, you're getting a lot of those stories coming out. But it, the reality is, under uh, America's freedom of speech rules, it's not easy to get a cease and desist for something like that, because it's not provable in any concrete, verifiable way. So that's, the, that's the, uh, what the AICPA gave us from that standpoint. It's not the first time Block does this. They do this about every three or four years, which really annoys us. And then we get in a big campaign and write them. We have a, a blog post that you could send to all your friends, put it on uh, any of your social media pieces that you want to to help do that, because I think it, our editor, Bill, did a good job of bashing them back from that standpoint. So if you look at our uh, macpa.org slash blog, right, that website address, you'll see that is in the first probably 10 posts uh, from the last few days, and that will help you from that standpoint. Yeah. Yeah, and, it's, that's true. You know, I came, I'm a CPA and I came up through the profession, and I'm an auditor guy. So, 
the first part of their ad is true. Right, right. Not all CPAs, not do, all taxes. CPAs do taxes. <laughs> so that's where, the, that's where the fine line is. But Correct. You know, be paranoid, disrupt yourself, go to war. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the reality is, as much, right, as much as it stings or, or it's annoying, the fact is it, is it is a reality in the market. The other thing Block is doing, by the way, speaking of competition, they've created a small business outsourcing group that's led by a CPA, I know her, Jennifer Catrulia, and they're trying to build out outsource accounting that CPAs could actually partner with them on. Now, I hope you guys aren't doing that, but the fact is that's what they're trying to do from a competition standpoint. So you're going to see... Um, some really more aggressive moves by them and others from that standpoint. Now, the flip side, we'll talk about what the comptroller is doing in Maryland to stop any of those who are fraudulently doing stuff, like Liberty Tax and some of the other ones, and what Peter Francho has been doing. We've been signed on with him on the Taxpayer Protection Act that's about cybersecurity and stepping it up from a um, potential of the U Maryland tax perspective. Yes. So if they do that, so the question is, if they do outsource accounting service, will that subject them peer review? Absolutely not, because under SARS-21, that's exempt from peer review. So if you're doing outsource accounting, but not putting an opinion on it, right, a review, a compilation, or an audit opinion, then you're not subject to peer review. Make sense? Yes. So, so I like that. So everybody start doing that. So when he says he's going to write himself a receipt for his own tax preparation, go to Block and say, I charge myself, you know, I got 200 bucks here. You'll do it for half, so uh, give me my refund or whatever. So uh, <laughs> you guys are crafty. Tell them not to mess with CPAs. So anyhow, we're, we're doing our best to, um, to try to offset it as well as we can, and, uh, but it is a bit disruptive. So to close that down, this is what I would say is my ideas for you that's what I would call surfing lessons, right? How do we ride the big waves instead of getting disrupted by them? Number one is embrace digital. You've got to do it. Those of you who are saying, I don't want to go to the cloud, you're going to have to start thinking about what do I need to do from that standpoint. Anticipate, we're going to talk about that and what we think we're going to do to try to help you do that, but you're going to have to learn to face the waves, the windshield, not the rearview mirror. Collaborate. If you're not good at collaboration, it can be taught. We're teaching it at the Student Leadership Academy. We're teaching it at our normal Leadership Academy. And we're actually world-renowned for it from the MACPA perspective. Number four, you've got to keep your rate of learning greater than the rate of change and greater than the competition, L greater than C squared. It's an absolute must, and it's going to be, require more. When we talk to students, students never take notes, right, today. You have kids, I'm sure, right? Or even new hires, where you sit there and you talk to them and they just look at you. And they don't take notes about anything you say. And then they, they go, I'm going to remember all that. Oh, yeah, you are. So, um, but, but when we do this with college students and even high school students, this is the one thing they write down. L greater than C squared. They look at it and go, I didn't really think about that. And it's fact, they do have to keep their rate of learning constantly. Protect the core. So those of you who talked about protecting our profession, that's absolutely on top of mind for us as your profession. It should be for you as a CPA. It should be for you in your businesses and industry pieces about what's my purpose, what's my values. And in a world where everything's changing, it's as important to know what shouldn't change. And what shouldn't change often is the purpose and values. And we're going to talk more about that as we get more for it. And then number six is you've got to make time for the future. So if, you know, Saturday morning you're sitting there catching up on emails, that's not good. You're going to have to say, when can I block time out to spend time just in the future? So we had Google come and speak at our summit last year, Ari Baylog, who's the head of their network infrastructure group. And uh, he said, you should like spend, get an app a week and just try it. How many of you guys are using Waze? So there you go, download Waze and try that on the drive home today. Download an app and try it and see what it does. Start learning how these apps work. How many of you guys use Uber? Wow, you do this with the high school group I did? I mean, the, the Beta Alpha Psi group I did? There's probably, what, 70% of the group, Becca, that did Uber and Airbnb. College kids, are you, Uber is a ride instead of if you want to, how many times have you been annoyed by taxi cabs? I've done it once. You do Uber, <laughs> right. 
You do Uber. Now, somebody's going to go, I just heard somebody got beat up and, and kidnapped by Uber drivers. And uh, that, that's what I'm going to hear from you, I know. And uh, the answer is, like, that was one out of, like, about a trillion rides, right? So uh, anyhow, yes, it's, got, it's not perfect, but it is making a dent. Airbnb, like, download a couple of those and try them. That's what I would say about making time for the future. So with that, I want to keep moving. Now, let's talk about anticipate. So what Dan Burris said is you can predict the future. Uh, and here's how. There's, he's got a great book called Flash Foresight. By the way, we do have some um, Twitter prizes we're going to give away. So we'll, we'll mention your name so we can get your names. We're going to send you either his book or Microsoft Office. Uh, is it the 2010 version, Andrew? So Microsoft uh, Office version. So you can get either one of those if you, uh, if you were on our Twitter list. But three trends, government regulations, technology in that pace of doubling, and demographics. He calls those future facts. So the thing about CPAs that I've noticed, and we've seen this as we've worked, it's very hard for us to think about predicting future things, right? Yeah. How many of you are uncomfortable doing that? Because you can't audit it, you can't validate it, right? All those things. Dan has kind of flipped our thinking about that because he says these are things that in fact are facts. For instance, demographics. We know how many Gen Xers are in the workplace. And they're going to be a year older next year, and you're going to see that trend, right? So that's a fact. Demographics is a fact that we can actually validate and verify. So when I have all these firms that call me up and go, I need tax managers. When are we going to get these tax managers? And I said, are you expecting like a spaceship to land and release a bunch of 35-year-old tax managers? Because they don't exist. There's physically not enough of them. So you're going to have to figure out a different way of approaching that, right? Or wait for the spaceship. Just stand out there and go, when's it coming? <laughs> so future fact, demographics. Future fact, technology doubling every year. It's, it's happening. And it will continue to happen. All the trends have already pointed to that. Future fact about government regulation. How many of you are experiencing this ourselves? Despite whoever wins the elections, it doesn't matter, does it? Look at what's going on in Mon Montgomery County. Are the regulations increasing or not? Yes. Are they increasing at the state? Yes. Are they increasing globally? Yes. Right? They introduced the hottest selling toy at Christmas was drones. 500,000 drones got sold during the Christmas season. And guess what? The F sorry, crashing. The FAA had to introduce regulations to control drones. So that's why you're going to see more regulations. It's going to continue to increase. Those are future facts. So what you're going to do is sit there and say, I can be frustrated by these future facts, or I can flip them and say, where's the opportunity in that? So let me give you an example. We have a CPA firm I know out in Kansas who does agribusiness. They have like the most agricultural clients in the country in terms of CPA services. So given this hard trend of government regulation in the agribusiness environment, they bought a lobbying environmental firm in DC. And now they offer regulatory services to their cattle farmers and agribusiness clients. Brilliant move. Brilliant move. Hard fact, regulations in our industry are going to get worse, correct? If you're in the food service industry, what do you think is going to happen? Food labeling, right? Restrictions on types of food. What happens when we 3D print hamburgers, right? All that stuff <laughs> is going to create regulations. So then you say, where's the opportunity in that? Oh. If that's my business, what should I do? Another firm that actually worked with Dan Burris, they realized the top trend is cybersecurity. How many people would say that's a top trend? Yeah, it's like Maryland's trying to position herself as the hotbed for cyber. So if that's a fa future fact, shouldn't you say, where can I make money on that? Where's the business model that I could figure that out for me or for my clients? Yeah. So this is a firm in Mississippi that had worked with Dan as doing the uh, anticipatory system. They came up with this idea that we got to do something in cyber. So what'd they do? You could make it, build it inside, or buy it. They went and bought a cybersecurity firm, and they just beat the big four in a big contract with a public company on cyber. Opportunity. So just start thinking about how can I look at what our future facts. And what Dan says is focus on the facts of the future and separate the noise, the soft trends and some of those other things. So we'll talk about some of those key areas. So here's the hard trend about regulation standard. This year in Annapolis, 30% increase 
in the number of bills that got heard in our 90 days. We're almost done. We've got about three weeks left. But 3,500 bills were heard. Typically, it's 2,500 in 90 days. That's crazy, right? And we've had to be more active than we anticipated because we're seeing more and more of this. So we're trying to get, how do we get geared up for the future fact that this is going to continue to get worse and worse and worse in terms of how we have to be on the, uh, on the thing. So federal, uh, here's some of the things we're working on. Tax due date changes. That was done by the federal. We had to do it in Maryland. It's passed both the House and Senate. Um, we expect that to be done. So Maryland's due dates will coincide with the federal due dates. Now, the federal is changing it again. So we're going to be back in Annapolis again next year, changing some of those due dates. Mobile workforce, this is the first time they think it's actually going to pass. We've been talking about this for about eight years, I think. Um, there's a movement right now. We just got an alert from the AICPA. They expect that to potentially get voted before Congress's summer recess. So that means you won't have to pay taxes on employees that work in multiple states. They won't, right? They'll, they'll have a de minimis. I think it's, there's a Senate House version. It's a little bit different. 30, between 30 and 45 days, contiguous or non-contiguous, days working in other jurisdictions you won't have to file taxes for. The other new one that just came in actually yesterday, so I didn't update my slides yet, is the de minimis 1099 correction. I know we've been talking about that for a long time. We met with Congress on it. It's now a proposal in the ways and means, and we hope that will go through. I forget what the threshold will be, but what that would mean is when you're getting 1099 corrections that we get from all these brokers, you won't, you know, if it's like within 250 or 500, you won't have to file an amended return. You'll just move it into the next year. Make sense? Yeah. Lots of members in our tax group have been asking for that. We're keeping our fingers crossed we can get that one through. DOL overtime standards, they're lowering the threshold for how much you have to pay overtime for, right? And I think it's going from 50 to 35,000. This could have impact on anyone who's using, you know, professional skilled people at those lower levels of wages. So uh, it's in, there's been a whole lot of comments against it, including us, the AICPA, the chamber, um, federal chamber, as well as the state chambers. But we're waiting to see what the DOL ultimately decides. They haven't published their final notes on that. So keep your eyes open for that one. Uh, standards, lots of standards going on. Peer review is changing pretty dramatically. Right now, we're, we're actually looking at that. Our peer review committee's weighed in on some of the uh, AICPA proposals. CPE standards actually went through one iteration. They're going through another one that's actually due, I think, April 1st. Is that right, Becca, I think? The CPE standards. She's looking at me like, oh my god. So uh, one, anyhow, I think it is April 1st. Um, CPA uh, not-for-profit exposure draft. And then revenue recognition, lease standards. What am I missing, uh, Edith? I've got to update this with some of your most recent things. So any of you in, in credit, uh, credit unions, that's significant. The Credit Union Association is fighting that one pretty significantly. Um, so that's credit losses for the credit union industry. So pay attention to that. By the way, go to macpa.org slash blog, and you can see we're putting, uh, this is where Edith is, a, is an amazing resource. She's watching a lot of the technical part of what we do and making sure that that is up to date on there. So if you want the latest, go to our blog and look at those most recent posts, and you'll get uh, deeper dives into all those issues. So um, lease standards, especially revenue recognition. What was the other one? Uh, the credit loss piece. Is there any other one? Uh, private company council is being reviewed, so that private company standards is up for grabs right now, and that's, uh, it's, that's most of the big ones, as if that's not enough. So, any questions about any of those? Not, not that I could answer them, probably Edith would. So, when we did this with our managing partners, we asked them what the top priorities were. DLL overtime, ca oh, cash basis is another one that's showing up in ways and means if they do uh, cash reform, they're going to try to take away the cash basis method of reporting. So there will be a de minimis rule for small businesses, but any professional services, accountants, engineers, architects, et cetera, would be um, adversely impacted by that as well as any other cash-based businesses. I wonder what the marijuana industry will do with that. Uh, IRS service levels is the other one that we've been talking to, to Congress about. Um, and this one was from the AICPA 
just this week, and this is what they forecast as some of the big issues that we've got going on. What is the future of the IRS? There's all kinds of debate about that. Um, prepare a regulation, that's been on again, off again, Supreme Court uh, cases about the P-10 issue, and uh, I think it's been finally decided and they're moving forward on that. Partnership audits is where they're starting to focus a lot more attention. They're using, by the way, cognitive computing to do uh, looking at some of the tax patterns that they see, and that's where notices are coming up. By the way, tax notices, they're up like 7,000% in the last five years. What do you think it's going to be in the next five years? Double that, right? Think about 14,000% or more. It's because why? Automation, right? The more things that are electronically filed, the more that they get some of that antiquated technology updated, the more power they're going to have to try to fish for revenue deficiencies. That's what they're doing. So they're trying to find the patterns to find where that uncollected tax is. That means you're going to get more false notices and your CPAs and CPA firms who deal with it are going to have to figure that out. So that's happening more and more. Obviously tax reform is on the agenda and then identity theft is huge. How many people have had identity theft issues? Any of you guys? Wow. That's growing. That's another trend that's going to be doubling. So we are seeing that at both at the Maryland state level and at the federal level. The IRS is saying that they've done a lot to try to start to combat that. It also is a kind of a dual-edged sword, right, because then it starts to get into like privacy issues and things. So um, anyhow, that's a trend that we're seeing more and more of. The DOL, we've talked a lot about. Department of Labor, for anyone who's got an employer-sponsored 401k or was it 403b, any of the um, retirement plans, you as employers are responsible for the quality of the plan, the plan audit. The DOL will come after you if your auditor screws up, right? So you can't just rely on the auditor. So you want to make sure your auditor is qualified. So you should ask your auditor, do they have, have they been peer reviewed and has their benefit plan, which is mandatory, been reviewed by the peer reviewer? If they say no, then they're actually in deep doo-doo because peer review has got to be reviewed based on what's happened over the last couple of years. The audit quality of our profession is horrifying. If you look, people that do one to two audits have a 75% deficiency. So here's what you have to watch as an employer. That rate might be really cheap, but if all that CPA firm does is a couple of these, you want to make sure that they're qualified. They should be members of the Employee Benefit Plan Audit Quality Center, and they should be make sure that their uh, work has been peer reviewed. So that's your responsibility. State boards are enforcing against the auditors who are dinged, but the DOL enforces against you as the employer because that's the only um, recourse that they have. Does that make sense? Yeah. So be careful on that. Um, and then here's our CPA. How many of you guys went to CPA Day this year? Wow, you guys, man, you are a slacker. Give those guys a round of applause. Put your hands up again. You're up there, right? So this was in the midst of that little clipper storm that threw all that snow and screwed everybody up. Uh, we still had a very strong showing, and um, it was critical, right, because we got more and more bills that are being filed. So that group made a huge impact, gave, a, gave out, I think, uh, packets to every one of the 144 legislators we had and, uh, and made quite an impact. Every January we'll be doing that again. We, haven't, we don't have the date yet for next year, but we will be publishing that soon. So we need you to be there. And by the way, business and industry folks, there are things that are going on down there that actually affect you. So here's the agenda, right? We monitor the State Board of Accountancy for all of you as CPA licenses. We also monitor the State Board of Tax Preparers so that they don't do anything that would adversely impact CPAs from that standpoint. So we've got a, a person that we actually appoint someone on the board and we have people attending the board meetings. Um, firm mobility is a big one for, for the firm side of what we're doing. CPE tracking and audits, they're trying to automate CPE tracking, right? Hard trend, automate that stuff. And then they're going to actually, if you take courses from us, you will be exempt from being audited. How about that? Huh? We get a little love for that? What do you mean? That's good stuff. <laughs> if, if you get audited, how many of you guys have gotten audited before? Anyone? So when you get audited, if you give our professional development team a call, they'll give you all the stuff that, that, you're, that the audit requires that you took from us. So any of the transcripts and all that stuff, certificates of completion, we'll get all that for you. So you don't have to go keep all that and dig it up. 
Um, but anyhow, they are trying to get better at auditing. They've stopped auditing back years now. They're only doing it prospectively. When you renew your license is when you'll find out whether you get audited or not, right? When you hit enter, it will come back like the Southwest ding and say, you've been selected to audit. <laughs> then you get to meet Bert. Uh, Bert's a 100-year-old CPA who uh, works one half day a week and audits <laughs> CPE taxes, so, uh, I mean CPE filing. So um, peer review has been another one. We've been under a lot of scrutiny from the, because of the Department of Labor, so we've had to deal with the state board on the peer review on a proactive basis. Now, in the legislature, we like to say there's two things we do, right? Offense and defense. Pass proactive good bills that help you as CPAs and stop bad bills that might hurt you as CPAs. Here's what we had, supersedious appeal bonds. This is unfinished business from last year. I'll give you an update on that in a second. Tax due dates to synchronize with the federal. We've done that. That's almost through both houses. Win interest rates. There are many members who got involved in the win sales tax deductibility notion, or tax deductibility notion, income tax. And uh, they were giving you no real interest rate on that. So we decided to work with some legislators uh, who said we're going to actually give you a legitimate interest rate on that couple of year refund. So uh, that got through the House yesterday. We hope that will go through the Senate. We'll be in good shape on that one. Peer review, subpoena power, we actually stopped the board from doing that. And uh, firm mobility, because of the Department of Labor issue, the State Board was not really open to um, loosening up firm uh, mobility licensing issues. On the defense side, mandatory leave, we anticipated it. It came in. It was a bit onerous. There are some people in our membership who like it. Uh, but overall, it was causing a lot of chaos with firm policies. So we opposed it for the compliance issue, not for the principle of wanting to have a good mandatory leave program. Certain counties, I know Montgomery County, I think already has a plan in place, and that's a trend that we're seeing, right? Counties are enacting things which are making it really hard for any business that operates across any boundaries, right? It used to be even across states, but that's getting a little crazier. Comparative fault did not come in, nor did sales tax on services, which are kind of our standing defensive agenda items that we fought uh, for years. We, we might expect those next year, uh, but we do know the governor would not let that happen from that perspective. Here's our appeal bond bills. This is uh, members who we went and testified both on the House on the left and the Senate on the right. Um, Brian Feldman, who's actually been down here quite a bit. He's your Montgomery County CPA in the legislature. He sponsored our bill on the Senate side. Delegate Dumay, also from Montgomery County. So if there's any way you can support those two, they are huge friends of our profession. So uh, Delegate Dumay happens to be the vice chair of the Judiciary Committee in the House. She sponsored this legislation. Effectively, here's the deal. You're a small business or a CPA and you get sued for a really big amount. You have to post an appeal bond equal to the amount of the suit in order to get to an appeal court. We think that limits your access to justice. If you believe the merits of the case should allow an appeal, you should get to have an appeal without posting an onerous bond because what's happening, and we've done the statistics on this, what's the lawsuits are rising or lowering in the amounts that trial lawyers put in? Rising, rising right? Because they're trying to get the lawsuit lottery, right? Let's put a big giant number in there. So if they put a big giant number in there and you lose in a lower court because it's complex and the court can't really figure it out, suddenly you're stuck and you're going to be out of business because you can't get an appeal. So the appeal bond is giving you the right to appeal by capping the appeal bond. So we started last year at a million dollars. The trial lawyers fought that tooth and nail. We raised it to five million. Now, if you have insurance, most of that should cover it, but this is really for that catastrophic you know, claim that comes in. And uh, so right now, we got through the House unanimously. We're stuck in the Senate committee. So Senate Judiciary, which happens to have a few trial lawyers on there who aren't real happy about that idea. So we're talking to them. We're going to meet with the chairman probably in the next week. We're about 30 days ahead of where we were last year. Last year, we didn't get it to the Senate committee until the last day of session, which this year is April 10th, I believe, that Monday. So Monday at midnight is uh, what they call signing die. That's when we have the last. Uh, so last year, the big cap bill we put in, $100 million, got through at 10, no, it was 11.49 p.m. before the final gavel hit. And uh, by the way, Vice Chair Dumay from Montgomery County was amazing getting that bill heard in the final moments of the legislature. So 
we got the big cap in. We're trying to get that small cap in for everyday members uh, like many of you guys in that standpoint. But look at the fiscal note that's on there. So when the, a bill gets written and submitted, the Department of Legislative Services, which is supposed to be an independent body in the assembly, looks at the bill and says, what's the fiscal impact on Maryland or Maryland, whoever gets affected by this bill? And what they said is this bill, means, the bill can be handled with existing state resources. In other words, no extra resources needed, but potential meaningful effect on small businesses that are able to post lower supersedious bonds that result from this bill. So that's, uh, that's why we did it and we're gonna keep fighting for it. It may be another year before we get it, but we're, we're, uh, we're gonna keep moving that along. What do you guys think? Is that something you care about? Like, should we be working on that stuff? How many of you even knew that was a problem? Anybody? Because you paid attention last year. See, he's the only one that listened last year. <laughs> Because Does it, stop so, them from appealing? yeah, so what, what happens is if you can't get an appeal, what do you do? Settle. Yep, settle right. So that means they get their cash and the settlement faster, right? So what the idea is I'll put a big bond amount in, you can't get it, appeal on it, so you're going to have to settle. And that's been a strategy. Now, the, the bill, the, the history of that law actually goes back to colonial days. It was for people that would get back, get on a ship and go back to England and skip out on the, on the lawsuit. Most of our laws, by the way, go back to literally the founding of our colony. So it's, it's amazing how many weird things are buried in the law that aren't really surfaced regularly. Now this one we did with a coalition. Someone asked the question earlier, are you working with coalitions to do this? The answer is yes. Maryland Tort Reform Coalition, Maryland Chamber of Commerce. In fact, the big four paid for the research to actually research this bill with us, to us as members, to actually get that done so that we could actually put it up as a strategy item. So that's how we collaborate and kind of leverage resources that we don't always have from that standpoint. Any questions, any more questions about that? So that's a fun one, stay tuned. Actually, if you guys want to, um, those of you who are on social media, <laughs> at midnight on uh, April 10th, is that Monday right? Is that right? I'm looking at Edith. Is April 10th Monday? That Monday night, April 10th at midnight, if you, if you log on to Twitter, you'll see us live broadcasting with Periscope from the State House on what the final uh, outcome of the General Assembly is. Then we'll obviously record that on YouTube and then we'll show it to all of you who aren't on social media when you come to our town hall series. How's that? Is that good? All right. So that's what's going on. We've been down there. This is the other couple of things that came in that we weren't anticipating. Taxpayer Protection Act, uh, Comptroller Francho called us up and said, would you uh, help us support that. We actually looked at it with our state tax committee and made him amend it before we supported it. There were some things, fraud issues, that he could broadly interpret to an average CPA who made a mistake, not fraud, right? And then we said, no, we're not going to let you do that. You can't have that level of authority. So he actually uh, amended the bill from that standpoint. Those are two partners from uh, Maryland firms that went down there to, to testify with me that day with uh, Comptroller Francho. On the left side is the win, both the win side and the uh, interest rate on audit, I mean on tax deficiency. So Maryland had a policy for years that said if you owe tax, you're going to pay a higher tax rate than if you owe, are owed a refund from a backed issue, right? So we said that's not really fair. We should, you should pay the same rate for both. And uh, Jeff Lawson, our state tax committee, and then that's Joe Flack who went down and testified on that, both that one and the win deficiency. So um, lots of activity. Uh, from that standpoint down there in Annapolis. And then that's Jerry Beard on our state tax committee. By the way, um, single sales factor apportionment. Many of you might be positive or negatively affected by that. That got through the House, I believe, yesterday or in the last couple of days. And um, we testified on the interest rate on def uh, tax deficiencies. We opted out of single sales factor and we were neutral on reduction in rates. Those all are moving. Those are bills that came out of the Augustine Commission, which was a commission to look at Maryland's competitive tax structure, which is actually an antecedent of the Maryland Competitiveness Coalition, which was a chamber activity that we worked on together. You guys might remember about three years ago, we started that work. So that's all moving through and actually trying to make Maryland more competitive from an income tax structure. So you could see, and some of you may not like it, you could see reductions in um, 
interest rates for individuals that make 100,000 or more, and you could see some corporate income tax relief. You'll see single sales factor potentially passing, and hopefully the interest rate tax deduction. We'll have a probably have a session after session in the May time frame to kind of have a recap of all the Maryland tax uh, and legislative issues that have happened because there's a lot in play right now. The other one that just popped in on our radar is making non-competes uh, illegal. So Maryland wants to nullify the ability for you to have a non-compete agreement with someone as well as NDAs are trying to nullify non-disclosure non agreements, which we think is actually bad practice. Why would you like nullify contracts? Um, anyhow, there's some people that are saying that people are coerced into them. So there's some mixed feelings about that. We opposed it in the past. It did get through. Uh, I believe it got through the House. So we're going to look at whether we should testify on that one in the Senate. So NDAs, um, non-competes, as well as mandatory sick leave are all issues that are coming up in Maryland that um, started a year ago and are starting to bubble with a little more momentum. Questions or comments about any of those? Generally, our policy is we stay out of big policy debates. We try to focus on things that matter for CPAs. So generally, if we testify on a tax bill, it's usually because of a compliance issue. You know, it's costing a lot, of, it takes a lot to comply with, or very complicated, it doesn't make sense. Kind of cost-benefit side of that, as opposed to the policy of it, right? So that's how we look at those kind of things. And, uh, and then the other one is making sure we have a competitive structure for CPAs to practice on. By the way, you do have the lowest licensing fee in the nation in Maryland. How about that? Yeah. You're lower than, you're lower than Maine and North Dakota. It's, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? For a big metro market like Maryland, you guys have the lowest licensing fees in the nation. Yes? Uh, was there any discussion in the legislature this year about uh, regulation of nonprofits uh, in light of what we've seen with the Wounded Warrior situation? And, uh, there, was a, there was one bill that would have actually loosened the audit. No, it, it raised the audit. Uh, requirement. So you, it was like a, or went from a half a million to 250. You had to have an audit if you're a nonprofit with any kind of state or federal money. I don't know what the status of that bill was, Jack. That's the only one I saw from that standpoint. So unless you know anything different, I didn't. We didn't see anything on our radar. Currently, are is a donor to a nonprofit entitled to a copy of the audit report if he requests it? I don't know that. From a Maryland law standpoint, I don't know that. Anybody know that? So can you, can you get a copy of that if you're a donor? Yeah. I don't know that. So you can follow with the state of Maryland if it's a state charities board. So if it's a C3, you can follow for the state charities and get it from that standpoint. And there might be something similar on the federal level, right, from the A133 A side. All right. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the CFO side of this, right? CFO controller issues. So this is something we've been um, kind of watching and updating relative to the technology. What's it mean to, to all of you? So this is Safra Katz. We talked about the CEO of Oracle was their CFO. She said it this way, the real way it was in finance in the world I grew up in is we spent all our time looking backwards. Modern finance and accounting is now, it's about <coughs> looking to the future. So I think that kind of sums up what we talked about a little bit this morning. This is a great resource, by the way. So have you, how many of you guys are familiar with integrated reporting? So I think it's, um, we'll send out a link to the integrated reporting report. You could put this down in your notes to Google it, right? Google integrated reporting, and there's a report from the integrated reporting council that actually, I think it's called the IIRC.org is the website. Check me. Fact check me on that one, Edith. The, T-H-E-I-I-R-C dot org. It might be one I in there. That's the, two I's? So the I-I-R-C dot org. So write that down. Pull down their report. This is a movement that came from Europe. It's beginning to try to wrap around sustainability reporting, strategy reporting. It's something that's been talked about in the profession since the Jenkins report back in the 80s of how do we upgrade our finance and accounting to have more meaningful information, clearly from an investor or stakeholder perspective, but I think it has merits in the private company sector. 
anyhow, what they talk about is this idea of integrated reporting is about trying to get a handle on your business model and making the financials reflect the realities of your business model. And the way they look at this, if you look at this business model, it's pretty interesting. They call it the capitals. So they would say that it's important about managing a business is six capitals. The capitals are financial, manufactured, something you make, intellectual, right? Intellectual property, brand, human, which we talked about, right? Your workforce and the human people you have in your business. Social and relationship. This gets back to your customer basis and, and relationships with suppliers and other things you have. And then natural, meaning natural resources. How are you using natural resources? Are you a net consumer or a producer, right? That's what they're talking about. And you can think about those from both inputs and outcomes, right? Businesses typically run those coming in and some form of those coming out. Then you take the whole model, right, which says inputs, and then you get into business processes and activities, outputs, and then outcomes. And so their idea is to frame this up to say, how do we start reporting about that? Now, for what you need to know right now, there is no standards or anything happening directly from this yet, but it is on our radar. It should, probably should be on yours. But here's the value of this. Read that report because it's going to make you more sophisticated about thinking about your business model. Because what I think is important for us as CPAs, not only do we have to be looking out the front of the windshield, but we also have to be looking outside of the business as opposed to inside the business. When I started accounting, everything I started to work on was what we accounted for inside the business. But what they're saying is what's going on outside the business often has a bigger impact and you're going to have to be more understanding and thinking about that from a CFO or controller perspective. And even if you're doing CFO advisory, you might want to think about this, how you could help your clients think about their businesses a little bit differently. Comments or thoughts about that? Agree or are you say I'm full of stuff? What do you think? So look at that, write that down, viirc.org. Download their report. That model is in there with a lot of explanation. I think it's incredible, but understanding, accounting, and managing the capital assets, which are all those six on both sides, right, going in and coming out, and what's that look like? And how do you begin to think about that from a measure perspective? CGMA, so we talked about the CGMA initiative and what's going on there. Here's some great resources that they recently produced. Joining the dots is the idea of integrated thinking for integrated reporting. So how can you start to be better at connecting dots in your businesses for your owners, business line folks, right? in terms of helping to add value. And then the other one is the digital finance imperative. This was done with Oracle, but it talks about how to start getting that digital thing moving inside your own knowledge base and what you should be doing in your company. So you can write those down and Google them. I think we'll include them as links um, when we send out the report from today. So we'll probably get that out in another day or two. Uh, so you've got links to all this stuff. Anyhow, this is what the, the um, joining the dots talks about, which is what are the new KPIs that are going to be driven from these new drivers of, of value, right? So as CPAs in business and industry, we've got to be thinking about what should we be measuring and how should we be thinking about that. So all those are areas of thinking about how that's happening. Again, I think it's great. It means we have to think about something differently because it isn't just about gross margin anymore or inventory turns, is it, right? It's a whole lot of different metrics that we have to be thinking about. And this is um, the, the digital part. It talks about the difference between folks who are lower on kind of stage one in terms of even thinking about this to the sophisticated, they call it the well-progressed, who are already measuring and reporting on the right things. Now, there are big data elements to this if you're a bigger organization, uh, as well as more and more technology pieces that are uh, in that. So I think it's, these are pieces I think we need to be paying attention to which is why we're seeing this whole trend in that CFO moving into those higher levels once they understand those relationships. All right, now I'm gonna do a quick, I'm gonna call it a business case about how we're dealing with disruption because our board of directors, when they in, kind of told us to move on some of these key initiatives, they said, I want you to do it, but I want you to report back to both us as the board and members on what you're experiencing as you're going through some of these 
what they would call uh, early adopter trends and changes. So we call it the shift change. Um, this was based on a post I wrote for LinkedIn two years ago that talked about the shift in workforce, right? This whole big movement of boomers uh, out, Xers taking the next level, and millennials and Gen Zs coming in. We talk about five major shifts, right? Leadership, how it's changing learning, how it's changing technology, uh, workplace itself, and the generational issue. Those seem to be common themes that we see over and over again, right? So we talk about how those are working. We've talked about this a lot, but the notion of leadership is now more collaborative instead of hierarchical. You see that every day. The notion of learning it used to be episodic and passive. Now it's becoming more just in time and continuous. And how do we start to reflect that technology? Systems of record are now systems of engagement. If you look at every software application there is, the one thing they have in common is what? They all have a feature of collaboration built into them. There are even accounting systems that are tied to social media. And like you go, well, why would you ever want that? Well, wouldn't you want to know what your customers are? If you could look in there and see your customers' uh, social media account on Twitter and Facebook, see what they're up to, it might help you figure out how you're dealing with them. So if they owe you a lot of money and you see them throwing a big party on Facebook, hey, come to the big, you know, big ballroom next week, you could be like, hey, I want my check, or at least invite me to the party. Um, anyhow, so these are things that we're seeing, uh, the workplace, right? How many of you guys are in flex, uh, flex or open workplaces right now? Anybody? One? You are back there, are you? No? Anyone else? So we saw a trend here, our major corporates that we do training in, mostly public companies, they've all went to open collaborative office spaces even for their statutory accounting SEC reporting folks. So companies like Marriott, McCormick, Under Armour, um, FTI, Sienna, all those guys in this region, they've all gone to open collaborative office spaces. That trend has also moved in the big four, but it's moved down into regionals, and it's a trend that we you know, clearly couldn't un ignore. The key about these trends, this back to being paranoid, is we're not saying you should or have to do any of this. What we're saying, though, is the trend's happening you have to decide when it's the right time for you to do it, right? Because these are starting to move down. Some of the old ways are going down, and new ways are coming up and emerging. That's how these big shifts happen. But they don't happen all at once, do they? Right? So the question for you is when should I make the shift change for us? That's what you should be thinking about, or your companies. And you have to be thinking about what the cost of, of not doing that is, right? Relative to your competition, those kind of things. So for us, we had to start thinking about some of these new things. So talent is a big one. This is huge, right? We've talked about this for a while. They say go to war for talent. That's the third item on the Harvard Rules of Competition. This is what we think about how you should think about talent. This is your human capital, by the way, right? So we call it the magnetic firm framework. Not CPA firm, but firm is in organization. So the magnetic framework for how you can think about this. We see four critical pillars of how you have to be thinking about your workforce in a going forward way. Purpose-driven company. Number two, great leadership. Number three, a culture of growth. And number four, an inspiring workplace. So these are, we've researched this quite a bit and we're seeing evidence of it all over the place. So you can dive down to each one of those, right? Vision, purpose, and values. Focus on strengths and positivity is what we teach in Leadership Academy. Inclusive and diverse and high performance, we call it insight to action, right? How do you think about stuff and make sure you're acting on it? From a leadership perspective, transparent and inspirational leadership. Build consensus and commitment. It doesn't mean you run the company by democracy, but it does mean where you can, you build consensus, you mobilize consent from that standpoint. Leadership development at all levels, and you should be anticipatory and proactive. The third pillar is a culture of growth, learning culture, self and formal development across all your levels, career growth and career plans, right? So how do I grow people in their levels? Every business we work with constantly says they're getting pressure from that standpoint. Customer focused, collaborative, and team based. 
Then the fourth one is the workplace itself, flexible and open. That's not right for everybody, but there are reasons you should think about it and do it. Work-life balance, coaching and feedback, and then effective technology tools. You've got to get mobile. And so mobile, remote, flex work are all things that are pretty much staples right now. Thoughts or comments? What do you think? Response? Huh? You just want your CP and get out of here? <laughs> I don't let you off that easy, do I? I'm going to double check for any questions. But any questions or comments? What do you guys think? Does this make sense or no? What's, what's your thinking? You see evidence of it? Yeah. I did. Based on our research. Yes. We've done this with a lot of firms and companies. We've seen this trend for a while. We've been tracking it. It ties into what Deloitte's human capital research is. And uh, we're seeing it consistently and we're seeing it more. So it's a trend that's clearly on the upswing. Not everybody's doing it yet. And your question is when do you need to do it, right? If and when do you need to do it. Sometimes you might not need to do it. But yeah, what you're thinking though, do you, you like it, not like it? Anything on there you say, nah, I don't like that part? Correct. Yeah, so for you guys on the, on the webcast, you can't hear probably that well, but he's saying this is, a lot of this is like business fundamentals. It's been around for years. In fact, it has. We actually have like tied this in to research. It goes all the way back to like Tom Peters in search of excellence, right? The hard is soft, the soft is hard. Jim Collins, right? So it's, it's been validated from some of the best thinkers in leadership and organizations and brought forward with latest thinking from like Simon Sinek, and some of those kinds of guys. So his point is he's saying he thinks it's pretty valid and a good way of at least thinking about it. Is that fair? Yeah. 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 Correct. Yeah, so comments, again, for the webcast audience is basically what he's saying is the fourth column, inspiring workplace, is pretty much if you have a lot of millennials in your organization, that's almost table, that's what you got to have that stuff. And uh, those who don't are seeing turnover rates that are starting to get higher and higher, right? Uh, so, yeah, we're seeing more and more of that. Again, trend is uh, up. We're seeing it in a lot of places. You gotta say, does it matter to me? And do I need to think about this or invest in any of that, right? That's how you have to think about it. So I got a couple more questions. Uh, MACPA blog response, Edith posted in Conferences IO. So there's a link there for that. Thoughts on the Maryland Liberty tax franchises being suspended. Um, Francho, when we were testifying in Annapolis, said that those things were really, really blatant that he's going after. So he's pretty serious about, if it's a mistake, he's not going to crucify anyone. And he said that over and over again. But if it's negligence or intentional, he's going to do, throw the whole book of the law at you. So um, that's why he's going after that. There's been tons of earned income tax credit fraud by organizations like that. I don't know any of the merits of that case or whether it's legitimate or not, but it is a, a major issue that he's been dealing with. So that's what I, would, that's what I know about that. Um, Uber is a great service. So there's somebody giving props to Uber. Uh, so I covered Maryland and Liberty tax deal, I think, adequately. Oh, we got it. You guys are on a roll. Please repeat the information about the prospective uh, audits. Is this related to CPA licenses, and how do they do that? I mean, when I said prospective, I mean in the current licensing period. So in other words, when you renew, the licensing period just before that is what they're auditing for CPE. That's what this question is about. They were going back like multiple years, so they would go back like two periods, which means you had to have CPE records for like, what's it, two years in a cycle? So you have the six years of, of records. That's crazy. We told the state board, stop doing that. Get current and only audit the two-year period right before the license renews, right? So that's what we mean by current period, not prospective. I, I used the wrong word there. Of all the boxes of uh, slides and things that we have. 
Right, right, exactly. I would say keep two years, current and two prior, but three year prior, if you had a problem, call us up and we'll go talk to the state board for you. He should not be doing that anymore. Um, lowest license fee, but how does membership compare? Our membership is in line with most of the um, large metro associations, but we offer a lot more services than they do even. So we're not, by far, not the highest. We're in the range of like Pennsylvania and some of the other ones around the region. So when you add membership plus your license, you got a better deal here, plus you get 24 hours of free CPE with our license. So um, I don't think anyone's doing that, by the way. So I think we're still one of the best. I've missed three check-ins due to buffering problems. The lecture is coming fine, but I didn't want to miss out on my credit. Can you guys email? Well, who should they email, Becca? Okay, got it. So that's been answered. I'm moving to Florida. What do I need to do practice in that state? I will mainly be doing tax returns. <laughs> You, uh, you got one of the hardest states to get a reciprocal in. Your Maryland license should allow you to get in there pretty easily. I think they have a couple other hoops because of the retiree phenomenon. So they got all these retirement CPAs going down there to keep practicing. Um, so if you email that, oh, there's a moderator's answer. Did somebody email that? Did you answer that? You're awesome. All right. So call our friends at the FICPA. Thank you, Rebecca. Good job. Uh, all right. So that one's already answered and impact of tax proposals on CPAs. It, it all, it's all depends on whether your situation fits single sales factor or some of those you probably, if most of you are earning uh, 100,000 or more, you'll get a reduction if that passes. And corporate tax, it's whether or not you're corporate or through a partnership. Um, so I think those are, it's like a kind of individual situation. So we've answered Florida. Uh, contact webcast support, we got that done. Repeat the question. I'm trying to do that more. Did I answer the ACA compliance question? I don't know. There was an ACA compliance question. Was there? Can you guys help with that? Is TriBridge ready to help with that? Can it's an ACA 1099 C 1095 C right? They want to know what the deadline's coming up. What's the question? Thoughts on requirements and those kind of things. Tell, tell them to send us an email. We'll get. Most payroll companies are doing those for their clients. Um, we get a lot of requests to do it, but the payroll companies are actually doing it. So check your payroll company first, right? And anything else? All right, so if not, send us an email, and we'll get it to our partners at TriBridge, and they'll uh, see if they can help you with that. That's why, we, that's why we're partnering with some of these groups, by the way, is to help us stay ahead of those things. All right, I think I got all of those, right? Any live questions from the group? All right, I'm going uh, to move quickly to keep, kind of catch up. You guys have had a lot of q and A. I'm going to have to, like, maybe I should do shorter stuff and just let you guys talk. So this is Glassdoor's... Uh, research that kind of fits our um, talent magnet. These are the issues that people care about, right? Culture values, senior leadership. It's that fourth column, basically. Career opportunities, work-life balance, compensation, and benefits. Millennials actually value work development, developing them in a career, and flex time more than cash bonuses. That's what we're seeing over and over again. Now, you have to pay them fairly. You're not going to be able to get, get away with subpar wages. But after wages, those are tops. They're actually tops for the um, college students that are coming into our profession as well. Now, let's talk about purpose. This is research that was done about industry, purpose by industry, and which ones are lacking. So accounting, finance, banking, and insurance actually are five levels below the average. The average is around 30%, which isn't very good. Our profession uh, is about 20%, meaning we aren't very inspiring. We haven't done a good job of instilling purpose and values on our folks. Now, if you're a CFO in a company, there's two levels. You should have purpose and values at the company level, and potentially you might even have it as a department, as a finance department, right? Finance and accounting department. So not a bad idea to think about. The point is, this is starting to become a differentiator from a human capital perspective. So, Start paying attention. By the way, HBR had a big article about KPMG put in a whole purpose initiative to reinstill purpose in their auditors. 
and it was a case study that HBR featured about a year ago. So if you Google HBR plus KPMG, you'll see that uh, plus purpose, you'll get that. And we found this when we did the Horizons project uh, for the AICPA, which is looking at the future of our profession. So we, the easy part is knowing why we chose a profession, the hardest part is remembering it. So how many of us got into what we did? We were all excited, you know, young and full of, oh, this is all the world's our oyster. And then you got in there and you're slugging it out every day, time goes by, and you kind of lose, what, why did you do this? Like, what, what, what difference am I making? I'll never forget, we were doing the Horizons work. We did this for the AICPA. Lots in Maryland. Anybody go to a future forum in Maryland? CPA Horizons? You did? We got only one in this whole group? There's one. Amy did. Two. You guys live under a rock? <laughs> or they forgot. Look, they don't remember. Dan was oh, similar. That's a different one, but, okay. but on the same venue. So you might have gone. You just all have amnesia. Is that what it is? Uh, I call it CRS, can't remember stuff. <laughs> so uh, anyhow, the fact is we were, we were at, I'll never forget, we were in Albuquerque, and this lady, she's about 50, probably 55 years old, had been in, a, in practice her whole career, and she's sitting there going through, like, reconnecting to the vision of the profession, and we were asking her, like, what was the purpose and all that stuff, and literally she started crying. And she goes, you know, until today, like, I lost connection with why I did this and how, how cool it is to think about a profession that makes a difference for so many people, and we do, in all the ways we work. And so sometimes we have to like reignite that. That's what the young people love, by the way. So us old people actually love it too if we actually take time to think about it. And many of you are saying, I don't have time for that crap. That doesn't matter. It does. You're seeing what it matters, right? It's, it's about one of the number one ways to inspire someone is to connect them to their purpose and your purpose. So here's the purpose that you guys did, thousands of CPAs, did not once but twice we're the only profession in the history of professions to do this and the only one that's ever done it twice we did it in 1998 I actually volunteered and chaired the CPA vision project when I became the exec in Maryland and then in 2011 we were hired by the AICPA to run the future forums all over the United States including Maryland we did a lot of extra in Maryland at their um, with their support and this is what they came up with that's our purpose at the top the vision statement is the middle, and the core values are the end. But if you Google CPA Horizons 2025 report, you'll get a full report that shows what the profession's overarching vision purpose was, created from the grassroots, not from the AICPA, by the way. And this was from thousands of CPAs all over the country, students, regulators, etc. So it takes some time to think through it, and they've got more detail in those reports, but it's important to know that that's a place to start from. What do you think about that? How many of you guys like that? When we did this with our Student Leadership Academy this past summer, we exposed it to them and said, what do you think, what do you like about it, and what would you add? The students were on fire. Like, I had no idea that we're thinking about a profession that actually has its own purpose and thinking about making a difference. They were just unbelievable. Am I right, Rebecca? They just loved that exercise. When we did this, we do this in all of our student town halls. When they get to see this, they just love it. So all you have to do is, is say, okay, what could we do with this to help inspire them to want to make a difference in our organizations? Now, you also can't then stick them in a corner and have them do rote work for the next three years. That won't work. <laughs> so you have to give them some supplementary work. But any thoughts on this? What do you guys think? It's not bad, is it? How many of you didn't even know it existed? So the AICPA did not do a great job of publishing it. By the way, we've showed it over and over again in these meetings, and you guys are just having that CRS thing where you're not seeing it. But um, we do have a purpose. We do have a vision. It's something that worth. I'm going to quickly go through what we're doing. So our board about two years ago said, we're seeing disruption. We're seeing some of the things that associations are seeing. We want you to make the shift change and show us the way. So do the research. Talk to us about what you're doing. And then we're going to try to enable that and make it happen. And so we actually used Deloitte, had a big study on workplace, and we used three goals that came out of their study, which we thought were on par with what we needed. One was help employees identify and address challenges and opportunities uh, that have the greatest impact on our business, looking at trends. That led us, by the way, to deal with Dan Burris later on. This is three years ago. Help employees strengthen high-impact connections inside and outside the organization by enabling them to collaborate with others easily. 
And then the third one was amplify the effect of those efforts by building an infrastructure that allows small improvements to scale easily across the organization. So our board said, get moving. That's about two years ago. We had three goals that we set in our strategy was one, we had to go mobile first. Mobile first for you as members was our biggest initiative, including learning, and then mobile for our workforce so that we could be remote and be out with members more and not lose work time. Number two was a collaborative office space. We had to break down our silos, make sure people could work across different ways, even though we're only 30 people. 30 people can feel like IBM sometimes when you try to get something done uh, and their silos get in the way. And then innovation and e-learning, if learning is a competitive advantage, what are we going to do to position you better from an e-learning standpoint? And that was the other three initiatives that have, been, that have held, by the way, for the last two and a half years. And I'm also here to say we're not done yet. So I'm going to give you the progress report and tell you what we did. This was our digital transformation strategy for our association management system, which would be equivalent of your databases if you're in corporate, right? And our accounting systems and all of our commercial transaction systems, what we deal with you from a member standpoint. Our member web experience, we're embarrassed about. It's horrible. And we're going to make it a lot better in about two months. We're in the final stages of making that shift. But it was costly to think about back when it was. And our association management system, like many association management systems, is horrible. It was an on-premise network environment. It was not very friendly and was not flexible in any stretch of the imagination. So this was our steps. Digitize and workflow. Make things, find ways of freeing up time digitize everything we could, paperless, et cetera, get ready, virtualize the systems, move them, we move them to Citrix, so we actually had a kind of mock cloud environment, and we outsourced our IT function so that we could free up that resource and move to more investment in cloud technology. And so Citrix was a good step, but it certainly didn't get us all the way there. The third step, which we're in the middle of right now, is transform to the cloud. And that's what we're trying to do and go all cloud. So we've moved our email systems about a year ago. We've done some more collaborative systems. Now we're moving on accounting and the association management system. This would be how you would be thinking about a migration strategy in your own environment at some level. Then it's finally the transformation to the cloud and then finally move the website and everything else. So we're in, the, we're in basically stages four and five right now. Make sense? This was our office move. Now, the big thing, our office doesn't look like that. That's Google's. Um, but it's not unlike that. We just don't have the balloons. Uh, <laughs> but here is the big insight from that, right? Our group didn't want to go open, at least our managers who were losing the window offices. That was the first ones to fight. So I had to, I had to say, look, I don't, I'm not, I don't even want an office. Just, I'll just go wherever I need to work. So just take my office out of the mix. And then the meeting planner and, and my CFO and Skip were like, uh, he's like, no, you've got to have a place. I'm like, all right, I'll take a place, but I don't, I don't want a place. So anyhow, like everyone's going to have a place. That was the concession I made. Because the standard right now is about, because of the way people are working remotely, about 75% is the right ratio of people to office that you should have, according to our space planner. That would be the leading edge of where space is going right now from an office standpoint. I wanted to go there, and then my COO and CFO talked me off of it and said that would be too disruptive for everyone not having a space to go to. So we end up with a, a place for everyone, but we took our whole group through this exercise that was eye-opening. We said, how has work changed in the last five years and in the next five years? So red dots were how it was five years ago. Yellow dots are how it is today, and green dots are how you think it will be in five years. So look at the shift, right? And this is our whole group did it, and then we compiled all those answers. So hierarchical to flat structure. See the red to the green, big gap, right? Structured versus fluid. Left, red, green, future. See the gap? Huge. We're already moving halfway there, according to the yellow. Single work point or multiple work point? Meaning are you doing just sitting there with your heads down doing your job all day, or are you working with others, right? So that was a huge shift. Planned connections or spontaneous connections? How much time do you spend on planned meetings and calls versus spontaneous meetings and calls? Huge difference, right? This was brilliant. Our space planner did an amazing job walking us through that. 
so you could just go down the rest of the thing. Independent work versus interdependent work. Individual versus group, internally versus externally or brand alignment. When the group did that, they like stood so, so back and went, oh, I guess we need an open office space. So they made the decision ultimately. And, uh, and, then we, and then we actually involved them in the design and went and did the work. There's some stuff up on the web. We've done interviews with AICPA. Uh, Blue Ocean did a great thing. But anyhow, we're in an open space. So here's the thing. It took us about six months to get acclimated. So the first thing everyone does in an open, so right now my office is equal to everyone else's office. Not one difference. Neither is our CFO or our COO or anyone. And we have an office space for everyone. So the first thing about this work is, it's not about the open office. Everyone's got, there's a bunch of haters on both sides of this, right? That all say you gotta do it or you don't gotta do it. The bottom line is you gotta fit the work to your, what you're trying to do from a strategy standpoint. So we wanted innovation and collaboration. We wanted people to work together and be able to do that faster. So what we did is create a workplace that's, we call it a kaleidoscope of spaces for people to work the way they need to work. So there are little private work rooms, there are little conference rooms that are all web enabled that have TVs on the wall for people to plug in in small groups. There are private conference areas where they can go to. There are single phone booth areas for them to go and have privacy when they make calls, right? Little mini collaboration and bigger collaboration spaces. So the answer is, when people come to work, it's about go to where the work needs to be done. You ha you're mobile, you have an, a laptop and a cell phone. You can go anywhere you need to go. So what we say is if you need a quiet concentration morning, stay home or go to Starbucks or wherever it works best for you. You don't have to come to work. And then come in when you have to do all those meetings. Or we use Google Hangouts so we can have people working from anywhere and they jump on the phone. We had a big snowstorm, right, Jen? I'm looking at you. So we had a staff planning day on the snowstorm. We didn't miss a beat. Everyone logged on. We went and spent about three hours working on Think Tank together and got tons of work done. Didn't miss a beat. And no one was worried about, do I need to drive in there and take the chance of having an accident or worrying about my kids getting off the bus or all those things. So that's the advantages of getting to this idea of a cloud environment. But it requires you to rethink things. So here's the difference, right? People would come in the first time, they all went right to their offices. They went, here's Tom's office, I'm gonna sit in Tom's office. And I acted like that's where I had to stay all day. And so suddenly we're like, no, the reason we have all these spaces, so if you need to go over and work with someone, just go work with them. Go sit down right next to them, there's like little seats everywhere, I can sit and work with you. Then I go up and go where I need to work next. It might be my own desk, or it might be someone else's desk. That's the point. And it took about six months for people to actually like come in and go, oh, I'm going to go sit next to, right? And I'm going to just sit here and work because we need to work together for a little bit. And then I'll leave and go somewhere else. That's the environment, right? So it's not about one place for you to do everything. That takes a mind shift. But it took about six months to get people to do that. And yes, we had all the noise issues. We have white noise popped in. We gave people headsets. If you want to be private, put your headset on and turn the music or just put you know, noise canceling and sit there and people know not to disturb you. But that's the environment that we've done and I think it's worked pretty well. So uh, we went to Google for work. It was either Google or Outlook. So we've done Google Apps. Best thing we ever did. It was really quick. It got adopted fast. Blue Ocean, by the way, is partners in helping us do this as well as our marketing. So that was our first step. We went out off of Outlook, which was a server-based uh, legacy environment, to Google Work Platform, Google Docs, Google Drive, uh, Google Mail, Hangouts, all that's integrated. It works amazing. Slack has probably been the one killer app that we got. How many people have heard about Slack? Slack's like instant messaging for internal groups. It cut down on our email traffic internally by like 90%. How many of you hate all the internal emails that you get that are unnecessary? So like, how many of you guys get the, hey, there are donuts in the kitchen, and then someone goes, oh, thank you, Tom, and then someone goes, no, thank you, Joe, because Joe brought in the, the cream cheese, and then, oh, no, thank you, Sarah, because you brought in the coffee, and like, it's a string of emails, and you're like out of town going, what the heck's going on? So <laughs> you got to clean all that crap out, right? That's the killer. Or, or the whole, I love the thank you etiquette, right? Thank you, no thank you, thank you. Oh, let's thank her too. And, and there's 15 thank yous. Uh, and we're like, okay, they thanked them enough. So Slack has taken all that offline and it's in channels where it's all transparent if you want it to be. So you can have private channels, but we have open channels by our key lines of business so that we can like dip in. So we've had people, Mary Beth, our, our regulatory lady, is in Columbia. She says, I feel closer to everything right now than I ever have because I can go dip in the seminar channel or I can dip in the membership channel and I can see what's going on. And if we need Mary Beth for something, we just do an at Mary Beth and all of a sudden she responds. 
So is it perfect? No. But it's made a huge impact. And there are some people that are saying it it's even gets too much even in that. We have some etiquette things that we have to work on. So this is kind of what we're doing right now. We're going, instead of going to a traditional AMS, Association Management System, we're going to put together an app ecosystem that all works in the cloud and plugs in together. That's kind of where we're going. And most of these things play really well together. For instance, Google plays with everything. But we're going to put Pipedrive in as our CRM system. We're looking at, right now, Sage Live or Xero. I think Xero is winning out because Sage Live is more in beta. But we think Sage Live would be an excellent one. So they're the two we're working on. We're migrating off of Microsoft Dynamics. And part of our accounting system is actually in the AMS. We call it a Centaur. Uh, Tally is our expense reporting software. Take a picture of your receipt. It goes in, codes it. Your expense reports are like all electronic instantly. Bill.com is for payables and billing application. Then we're using Stripe for commerce at the credit card level or at the web level. Amazon Web Services is the outsource uh, web infrastructure that will host everything. You could look at Google. There's a lot of them out there. It's, it's a tier one provider. Um, on the human capital side, Slack, Google for Work, and the newest one is Office Vibe, which we kind of love. Office Vibe actually measures employee engagement. It links into Slack. That's the killer with these apps, right? They all integrate with each other, and, the, and every like month, there's like new features that you didn't even know were there that come in automatically. No one has to go install a big upgrade and worry about everything crashing anymore. So that's kind of how we're playing with it. I want to give you a couple key pieces. Um, oh, WordPress is our web platform uh, integration. So that's kind of what we're thinking about right now. We're in that final phase of implementing those things. This is Office Vibe, and it measures 10 metrics of employee engagement. So not only is this interesting because what it's doing, it, it puts little polls out to your employees. They can give you a feedback. They can give it to you anonymously or with their name attached to it. They can also answer little polls, and it measures the progress of the organization. Yellow is obviously something you've got to pay attention to. Green, you're in the zone. Red, you're in trouble. And uh, it's pretty simple. But anyhow, look at those 10 things, right? Remember the grid I showed you on the, on the magnetic firm? That's all that stuff. That's how you measure employee engagement. Gallup says 70% of your employees, actually the most recent stat, 72% of your employees are disengaged. 25% of those are actively disengaged. That means they hate you. And, <laughs> and not only do they hate you, but they want to stay around and make you miserable. That's the worst part. They won't leave, right? They, don't even want, they won't even leave. So um, the point is you've got to pay attention to this employee engagement metric. And this is a simple, I, I think it costs for us, it's like 600 bucks a year. It's like 30 bucks a month or something. It's crazy. So um, this is kind of cool. This, was our, uh, this made us feel good. This is our metric. They actually benchmark you against all the companies in their database, companies that include things like Google and, and uh, Microsoft and Adobe. And our ranking was actually 7.9, considered very good. And they said we're in the top 20% of employee engagement. So that makes us feel like we're trying to connect to our human capital really well and keep them uh, happy with us. But I would say we have not arrived. We've talked to our team about this a lot. We're in the middle of a lot of change. There's a lot of stuff that we have to learn and transform. And we still have, in the next two months, a lot of this work to do. And then it'll, it'll be tweaking it over the next year. So for you as members, you should see a new web interface by dues renewal time. You also have options to pay your dues by month. And, uh, and we hope you'll give us a lot of feedback around that member experience. And what do you think? How's it working? All those kind of things. But you're going to be able to get your records of transcripts, everything from how, what, what you're buying from us. All that will be in an easy, like Amazon store setting. Now members call us up and go, I need a receipt for that. And we're like, oh, God, uh, it's horrible. So that's what we hope to be doing with you and for you uh, in this next few months. So keep, keep aware of that. Uh, I want to kind of close with a couple things, this idea of being future ready. This, again, from the AICPA study. And the key points are aware, predictive, and adaptive, right? See the wave figure out whether I should ride it, dive through it, or go over it, and then adapt to that wave and be ready for the next wave. That's what we think our intention is to help you guys be more future ready. We've done a whole lot of research on this. This is Conference Board, Horizons, the Future Ready Report by the AICPA, um, 
CGMA's Global Competency Framework, and they're all saying the same thing, which says it's time to pay attention, because actually this stuff's about eight years old. And every year it's, it's re-upped and it's the same stuff. So we gotta move the needle on this. This is conference board, right? This is global corporations, and those are the things they say you need to do. Anticipate and react to the nature and speed of change. 25% of global companies are not future ready, and the ones who are are three times the performance uh, in the top 20%, 300% better than the other companies in their groups. So I think there's some money in this too. This is the horizons competency, six competencies. We've talked about these kind of ad nauseum, right? Communications, leadership, critical thinking and problem solving, anticipating, serving evolving needs, synthesizing intelligence to insight, and integration and collaboration. This was from you guys. You guys said this a year ago when you said, what are the top five things we need? This is the CGMA framework. We're not gonna go into detail there, but only one box is technical. Three quarters are not technical. That's Right? So how much time are you spent on getting non-technical training? You should be thinking about that, right? Now you came here today, so you're getting non-technical. I'm not giving you a standards update. Uh, and this is what you said last year. In all the town halls we did, these were the top five uh, skills that you guys identified almost identical to the Horizons research. Almost identical to the conference board research, right? And this is what you guys said. So 75% of these competencies cover everything you said you needed. So the question is how much time are you spending trying to get those skills versus other skills? So I think it's time to start thinking about that from your own development perspective, right? What does this mean from, from your perspective? And this is where we did the research a while ago and met Dan Burris and started talking to him about what he saw on the global company stage that he works with. So we think that you can learn how to be proactive. You can learn how to be anticipatory. And that's what we worked on with Dan for about the last year. Now there are folks in here, I know Amy, you were at one of the Burris events, right? I know you were, Kelly. Who else, anyone else who was at one of our Burris events when we worked on this with them? So we got like a, you were, yeah. So Noah's Ark uh, is our approach. We get kind of two by two of every segment of our profession, CFOs, controllers, small practice, big practice, public companies, right, large firm, et cetera, government, not-for-profit, educators, students, young professionals. We got him in the room with Dan. We spent a day working on what he did, and we customized it for accounting and finance people. Because what he had had examples like from pharmaceuticals that would like, most of you, if you saw that, would be like, Hood, what are you thinking? Like, we're not pharmaceuticals. So we had to make things that were relevant to the CPA community. So we added the context, as Dan would say, to his training program, and that's where we embedded it. And since then, we've got quite a bit of accolades, but here are the competencies that Dan had baked into his system from the start. This is what appealed to us, because it fit all the research we saw. And so we took that and added the context of the profession to it. And, uh, and this is the idea, right? If you can anticipate, you can jump the disruption curve, right? You're less likely to be disrupted by something you don't see because you're gonna be thinking about and looking for both opportunities and threats from that standpoint. So we would say instead of getting into that, I'm gonna resist and reject, I'm gonna be the taxi cab uh, rejecting Uber, I'm gonna say how can I embrace this and move forward? And I'm gonna give you this quickly, but this is the secret to change. It's a model created by, uh, I think it's Dan Weiler is the lady who created it. And it says you need these three things to initiate change in your organizations and even for yourself. So it goes like this. D is dissatisfaction with the current state or the status quo. V is a vision, a direction for what I can do that's different in the future that will get me moving. And F is I need the first steps. I need to know that I can take at least one step in that direction so I can then take another step and move forward from that perspective. Does that make sense? Those three have to be greater than R, which is the resistance to change. And if any one of them is not present, what happens to your formula? It's multiplicative, right? So what happens if D is zero? The whole formula is zero, right? In other words, they have to all three be present. So my point is when we start thinking about what Dan's doing, 
Dan's work gives you, actually gives you all three of those, but more importantly, by looking at hard trends, it allows you to make the case for why the status quo is dangerous and what needs to happen next, thinking about the opportunities that go with it. Does that make sense? That's where we think the power is. He also has things in there, everything from collaboration to communication to how you involve young people, cross-generationals, all that's in the learning system. So that helps you fit all those other pieces from that standpoint. This is the mapping to the CGMA. We've obviously mapped it. We also have a new program called the MBA Express that's also mapped around a lot of these competencies. In other words, we're focusing our effort on new learning to build you these things that you might need to help keep you future ready. So that's the mapping of the MBA Express to the uh, CGMA competency model, which is pretty comprehensive. So again, everything in the green, yellow, and blue is where we've been spending a good bit of time. So here's some examples from Burris. We don't have a lot of time, so I just want to kind of give you a, a, a little bit. But what Burris is saying is he wants to give you a longer view in the uncertain environment we're in. But he does that by the idea of hard trends and teaching you how to think about them and how to actually apply them to your own situation or business. So as he puts it, your future view is your future you. So how are you thinking? So he wants to try to give you that longer eyesight. Here's the notion of hard trends and soft trends. These are actually job aids that are in it. So here's what it is. It's 28 lessons in four modules, three minute video lessons, each concept, one concept at a time. Here's soft trends. Here's hard trends. Here's future view. Job aids to help you like look at it, visualize it, and learn it, read it. And then he's got exercises that you actually apply. So you can apply by writing them online. You can print them out and fill them out. You can email them to yourself, et cetera. But that's how you actually progress through the system. We put our entire team at MACPA through it, including me. Uh, we've had several firms uh, initiate it. And uh, some corporate are starting to do it as well. And we're getting back some pretty good feedback from that standpoint. It's 295 bucks. Uh, it's on our website. And you can do it at your own pace. We think you should ideally take about four or five weeks to do it, even though it's three minute modules, right? But it's three minutes and the exercise. If you don't do the exercises, don't waste your money. It's not, it's not gonna give you anything, right? It'll be, it'll be entertaining. But do the exercises, then when you wanna apply it again, go back and do it. So when you're getting ready to have that meeting with your management team, you could go back and say, let's look, you can look at those videos together, put them up on the screen, and say, here's what Dan says about hard trends, soft trends, and start to play from that standpoint. So I want you to know about that. Uh, we did just get recognized by Accounting Today as one of the top learning products for 2016. So we were kind of excited about that. And that's what the editors of Accounting Today said uh, from this perspective. So they, big fans of how it looked and works. It's, uh, it's innovative. It's got the nano learning component. Uh, the older folks that looked at it, by the way, said that, um, that actually they thought it would only appeal to the millennials and yet they found that their older partners loved it in terms of they could do three minutes at a time, do an exercise, stop. It will put you right back in where you left off. You can be doing it on your iPad, stop there. Pick it back up on your laptop, stop there. You could do it on your mobile phone, but you better have really good eyesight from that standpoint. <laughs> Certainly, I couldn't do that. Um, anyhow, this was some of the thoughts we got from folks about what did you learn and why was it important. And you could see where people actually felt like, I learned how to think differently. That's our hope for our profession, right? That you guys will learn how to actually think differently and stay ahead of this change forever, right? Because it's something that you can, you go through it once, but you've got it to go back on, right? You can dip back in there anytime. I want to see how we do that opportunity piece. Or I want to look at how that generational thing worked. You can dip back in there from that standpoint. So, questions or comments? If you want the website, blionline.org slash AO. And if any of you want to stick around afterwards, our team can like, boot it up and show them. Kelly, any thoughts? Because you did, did you, did you finish it? She didn't finish it yet. Oh, I should. <laughs> Anyhow, you, you uh, it, it does, we're actually going to think about creating a community of practice around it because it, it does work better when you can collaborate sometimes. So if there's a couple people in your organization, you do it together and then compare results and share what you're doing. I want to finish with a couple quick things about what we're doing and, uh, and kind of close up here to get you guys out on time. Does anybody remember this from last fall? Yeah. Wow, you guys do. We do. Uh -huh. are, those are Norfolk pines in Maui. Remember the story is Captain Cook planted the pines so that future people would have wood 
to, so this is our council delegation, our executive committee and council at New York last week, actually on Monday, where we weighed in on some of the big issues affecting the profession. We meet as the AICPA council uh, three times a year, so we represent you, if you will, before the AICPA. The CGMA has been approved. We talked about that. We approved it as a board and are looking at expanding our membership for non-CPAs who are going to be CGMAs, and that will happen in a non-voting way, right? So the profession will kind of keep its core, but we will have them uh, the ability for them to show up at some meetings and get advantage of learning. So if you're a CFO in a company and you have non-CPA staff, you could actually bring them as members to keep, keep up with things, right? That's how we're thinking about it. The small practitioners worry about this as saying, would they ever do tax or audit? The answer is no. That's purely a CPA reserve service. This is purely a business and industry or consultant play from that standpoint. So look for that. And I know many of you are saying, I wish I would have done that when it was available. This is our work with the uh, National Academies of Finance. That's uh, Rebecca was there uh, with a lot of these high school students. Kimberly Ellison Taylor, remember her? She's the new, will be the new chair of the AICPA in October of this year in Florida. She's the youngest chair ever of the AICPA, the first black chair of the AICPA in its 127 year history. She happens to be a woman in case you didn't notice. <laughs> and she's a business and industry member. She works for Oracle. So she fits about every off dynamic that you could get. And isn't it cool that she's going to be the leader of the AICPA? We round of applause for Kimberly. For those of you on the webcast, she's the second from the right, from that standpoint. Um, and this one's a little fuzzy. This is the Beta Alpha Psi group that I spoke to in Towson. And this was about 300 college students from the Mid-Atlantic. So that's the, these are our pipeline initiatives, right, to help give you a good supply of young kids like this. This is our Student Leadership Academy. It's free. So we do that as a service to, uh, to those young people. And that was our first one. Next one's... June 2nd through 4th of 2016. Anyone who wants to sponsor it, you can see Rebecca or uh, Connect. This is our guide to becoming a CPA. The state board is so, website is so poor, we created our own. It links to the website, but in a much more friendly way. So if you want to encourage someone in your office to get to their CPA, use that URL. Our swearing in ceremony, where we make them take an oath of office for public service is another one. Again, see the pipeline, S high school, college, CPA, swearing in, become licensed, and then we get them in our leadership academy and we teach them skills like collaboration and strategic thinking and uh, being proactive from that standpoint. August 24th through 26th, if you have any young people, you want to be leaders in your firms and companies, send them to that and they'll come back ready because we've seen lots of examples of that from that perspective. Diversity and inclusion, another example of what we're doing for our profession. Women to watch and men who get it. I think we're changing the men who get it award to something more appropriate. Um, but it was fun for the first year. Anyhow, uh, a way to recognize uh, diversity and inclusion in everything we do from that standpoint. And then Brian Feldman has said this down here many times. In addition to being the cheapest state, we're also the best licensed state based on how you can practice, flexibility of our rules and regulations. For instance, you could take all your CPE online. I think we're the only state in the nation that allows that. You don't have any crazy rules anymore. We fix all those things as a matter of what we do. And then this one, basically a shirt I just bought, says CPA because freaking miracle worker isn't an official job title. <laughs> it just popped up on Facebook and I'm like, I gotta buy that shirt. So I did buy it. It's because this is who we care about, right? We happen to believe in CPAs. And uh, we believe that everything you do is critical to our environment in terms of businesses, nonprofits, government, practice, all those things are part of the infrastructure and us as the trusted advisor. So we want to keep that right from that perspective and go forward. So the last thing that I'm going to, they're going to throw a, a eval at you. I wish you'd do that eval before you walk out the door, but calendar appointment with yourself for the future just one hour a week, put it on there today, sometime today. Because if you don't, you'll never do it. So just schedule an hour and say, I'm gonna use that hour 
to look at the blog and what the future looks like. Look at some of these trends. Maybe I'll take the anticipatory organization. Do something that positions you for the future because we need you for the future. That's the only way we're gonna thrive as a profession and you guys gotta do that to make us better, right? So take that one hour. Thank you guys for, uh, for being with us and um, have a great day. So you should have seen the eval on your app, right? So hopefully you're clicking on those answers or even when you get back you can finish it at work. And thank you guys on the webcast.